Chapter 18 of The Romance of Plant Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Stays. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Elliot. Chapter 18 Poisons. Poisoned Arrows. Fish Poisons. Manchineal. Curare. A Wonderful Story, Antiaris, Ordeals, The Obi Poison, Oracles Produced by Poisons, Plants Which Make Horses Crazy and Others That Remove Their Hair, Australian Sheep and the Cossack Creeper, Swild Head, Madness by the Darling Pea, Wild and Tame Animals, How They Know Poisons, How Do They Tell One Another, The Yew Tree, when is it and when is it not poisonous? Even today, all embryo chemists and doctors are required to pass in the recognition of the more important medicinal plants. But their knowledge is probably very superficial as compared with that of a bushman in the Kalahari Desert of South Africa. Every man, woman, and child in such a tribe knows thoroughly every plant that grows in the neighborhood. His diet is a varied one, for it includes maggots, fish, frogs, snakes, white ants, and other horrible ingredients, but he lives mainly on roots, bulbs, and other herbs of sorts. In times of famine he has had to obtain the most intimate knowledge possible of many plants, that namely which is obtained by eating them. He has most carefully observed the poisonous kinds. These latter have given him, too, a very powerful weapon for it is the poisoned arrows which give him the chance of killing game otherwise utterly beyond his reach he is on the fair road to becoming a hunter and a tribesman instead of being only a member of the morose outcast family always wandering and always hungry probably poisons were first used in fishing many vegetable drugs when thrown into pools and lakes have the property to stupefying or killing the fish a great many of these fish poisons are known, and it is quite easy to use them. Amongst the dyaks of Borneo, screens of basket work are placed along a stream to prevent this fish from escaping. Then the dyaks collect along either bank in their canoes. Everybody has a supply of the root of the tubai, minispermum species, which they hammer with stones in the water inside the canoe, so as to extract the poison. At a given signal, the poisonous stuff is bailed into the water, and very soon afterwards a scene of wild excitement begins, for the fish are speared or captured with hand nets as they rise, stupefied, to the surface. The women scoop up the small fry in their nets. Even at the Sea of Galilee, Tristram mentions that Arabs sometimes obtain their fish by poison breadcrumbs. In the South Sea Islands at Tahiti, a poison is obtained from the nuts of a kind of botonica and is used to catch the fish among the reefs near shore. In West Africa, several fish poisons are used. Example, seeds of Tephoria vulgelli. And probably the same methods are used almost everywhere. They are by no means extinct, even at home, for the occasional poacher sometimes use fish poisons. Arrow poison is, however, much more important, and is used by a great number of tribes in almost every part of the world. In 1859, in a war with the Dyaks of Borneo, the English army lost 30 men by poison arrows. They are deadly weapons, for the dart is a very thin piece of reed or cane, which has been dipped in the upas poison, Antiaris toxicaria. It is propelled from a blowpipe, which in practice hand is able to carry 250 feet. One or two of these darts may cause death in two hours' time. The Spaniards, in their conquest for West Indian islands, were often defeated by the poison's arrows of the Caribs. The wounded die in agonies of suffering and delirium, sometimes protracted for twenty-four hours after receiving the wound. The poison in this case is supposed to have been the Manchineal, Hippomane. It is a handsome tree, but a very dangerous one, for the slightest cut on the surface produces a flow of very fine white milk, which is acrid and poisonous. This juice produces temporary or total blindness if the slightest speck enters the eyes, or even if one sits over a fire made of its wood, 
it is probably not true that the people are killed if they merely sleep below it and grass will probably grow quite well under its shade although there are stories which deny this blowpipes and poison darts are used by many savages in asia and south america perhaps the curare or wurali poison is the most wonderful of the south american kinds the tree strychnus species grows along the amazon and in the guianas the poison is obtained from the wood and bark and several other vegetable substances are mixed with it this is a very common feature of native drugs and increases the chances of doing something it is a blood poison and a very deadly one large animals like the tapers stagger about collapse and die after a very few steps if they have been wounded by a dart humboldt declares that the earth-eating otomacs were able to kill their antagonists by the mere pressure of their poisoned thumbnails in africa it is more usual to find poison arrows shot from a bow the exquisitely beautiful seed of the strophanthus combe is used as an arrow poison the plant is a climber found in the forests or bush and has a large woody pod about seven to twelve inches long when these are open the inside is seen to be full of the small yellowish seeds each ends in a fine on three to four inches long which carries at the end a beautiful tuft of the finest silky hairs the seed coat is also covered with silk hairs when viewed against a black surface there is no more lovely object in nature yet from the seed coat a very deadly poison is obtained probably snake venom and various gluey substances form part of the mixture which is dabbed on the arrows dr colby saw the hottentots plastering their arrows with the poison of the hooded snake bushmen use a lily bulb hemanthus toxicarius but sometimes add part of the inside of a small caterpillar another african poison which is not so well known is the acocanthera which was the ingredient in the arrows obtained by the writer in british east africa north america is singularly free from these unsportsmanlike and horrible weapons but they were not unknown in europe in very ancient times pliny speaks of the arabian pirates as poisoners and allusions to their use of deadly arrows can be found in horace ovid and homer in the odyssey the hero goes to ephyra ephyrus to purchase a deadly arrow poison but he is refused for fear of the eternal gods poisoned arrows were employed by the celts in gaul and also by the saracens in the war of granada in fourteen eighty four yet even in the time of homer the sense of humanity seems to have decided against poison arrows as being both unnecessary and cruel just as in our own times explosive bullets have been condemned and they are no longer used by civilized nations but we should remember that until man became so expert with the bow and spear and so civilized by tribal fights as to be able to do without poisons they were a very useful help in the struggle for civilization hundreds of thin pieces of bamboo about six inches long were regularly carried by certain african tribes when dipped in poison and afterwards placed in paths in the ground they formed a very efficient protection against barefooted enemies the antiaris alluded to the above is famous upas tree of java the tree was said to grow in a desert with not another living thing within ten miles of it such was the virulence of its poison that there were no fish in the waters neither rat nor mouse nor any other vermin had ever been seen there and when any birds flew so near this tree that the fluvia reached them they fell dead a sacrifice to the effects of its poisons out of a population of sixteen hundred persons who were compelled on account of civil dissensions to reside within twelve or fourteen miles of the tree not more than three hundred remain alive in two months criminals condemned to die were offered the chance of life if they could go up to the upas tree and collect some of the poison they were provided with masks not unlike our modern motor veils and yet not two in twenty returned from the expedition all the foregoing statements were for years implicitly believed they were vouched for by a dutch surgeon resident in java 
Medicine is a profession, and Holland is a country which would in no way lead one to expect such magnificent, mendacious audacity. For the whole of the preceding statements about Antiaris is pure romance. The inner bark of young trees, when made into a coarse garments, produces an extremely painful itching, whilst the dry juice is a virulent arrow poison. Hellebore and aconite were favorite poisons of the Marquis de Brinvilliers and other specialists of the Middle Ages. The Christmas roses, or hellebores, were known to be poisonous 1,400 years before the Christian era and are still used in medicine. Aconite, which has a tuberous root stalk, is dangerous for it is occasionally eaten in mistake for the horse radish, to which it has a faint resemblance. All kinds of aconite are poisonous. That one of the Indian species is used to tip the arrows employed in shooting tigers. Trials by ordeal were very common in ancient times. The theory was that an innocent person was not injured by certain drugs which, however, proved immediately fatal to the guilty. Such trials at one time were customary in almost every part of the world. They were supposed to be perfectly just so that no man could be held guilty of the death of those who succumbed. In practice, however, they were almost invariably corrupt. The Tagnihia venifera of Madagascar was regularly used in ordeals, and is probably still employed by certain tribes. The seeds are exceedingly poisonous, but if the authorities wish the accused person to escape, a strong emetic is mixed with the powdered seeds, and the poison has no time to act. This, however, is seldom the case, for in any savage nation, no one who is popular and in good esteem with the king or other people in authority is at all likely to be accused. The fact of his being accused means in most cases he is already condemned to die. Another ordeal plant is that of the calabar bean, Phyosigma venenosa, found in West Africa. The plant is a climber belonging to the legomose, and the seeds, which are about an inch in diameter, are very deadly. The seed is conspicuously marked by the long, dark, sunken scar, where it was attached to the pod. Besides being exceedingly poisonous, it has also a curious effect upon the pupil of the eye, which is contracted by the drug. Another famous poison is produced from the Datoria stramonium and allied species. In tropical and subtropical countries, one is almost sure to find species of this handsome plant along almost every roadside. It is, in fact, one of the most commonest tropical weeds. The leaves are large with fine spinosae margins, and the flower is most conspicuous, as it is four or five inches long. This is supposed to be one of the drugs employed by the obi wizard and witches. The most horrible rites, accompanied by atrocious cruelties, were performed amongst certain West African tribes and are continued amongst their descendants, the freed slaves of the West Indies and of the southern United States. Even today, no white man is allowed to learn anything of the proceedings, but some form of devil worship or shamanism accompanied by incantations and the use of poisonous drugs still flourishes. Preparations of various sorts of datura or thorn apple produces sometimes stupefaction, sometimes frantic, furious delirium, and sometimes death. It is used in medicine as a narcotic and a diuretic. Burton says that Arabs smoke the leaves in pipes as a cure for influenza and asthma. It is sometimes used in Europe for neuralgia and even epilepsy. On the other hand, the priests of the ancient Peruvians used Datura to produce the ravens mistaken for inspiration, and it is supposed that the priests of Apollo at Delphi employed an allied species for the same purpose. In India, China, West Africa, and amongst the American blacks, it is still very commonly used. A firm belief exists in the Middle Ages that every plant was a good remedy for something. There is a real basis, in fact, for the superstition, because every plant in the world has, so far as it can do so, to protect itself. The attacks of all sort of grazing animals, from the mouse to the elephant, as well as the infinitely more dangerous and destructive insects, bacteria, and fungi, have to be provided for. By far, the commonest form of production is to develop within the plant strong medicinal or strongly smelling substances. 
These are far better as protective agents than the thorns and spines characteristics of deserts and half-deserts. We have already glanced at the turpentines and resins of the coniferous forests and at the odorous gums, frankincense, and myrrh of the acacia scrub. The use of poisons as protection is eminently characteristic of three of the natural orders, the buttercup, ranunculaceae, the potato order, solanaceae, and the lilies. Of the first name, the celery-leaved, and indeed all buttercups, are extremely poisonous. So also are all aconites, hellbores, as well as marsh marigolds, vidanus, clematis, and laxpur. Others, though not poisonous, are strongly medicinal, such as blake snake root, hydrastis, etc. It is therefore inadvisable to use any of this order for food unless other people have eaten it without any inconvenience. The beauty of the lily order does not prevent it from being a particularly dangerous group of plants. Perhaps the worst poisons in order are those of the meadow saffron, colchicum autumnae, herb paris, ratrum, sabadilla, lily of the valley, tulip, and crown imperial bulbs, camelirium, trillium, squills, garlic, salmon seal, aloes, and the sarsaparillas are all well-known medicines. The order of Solanaceae is perhaps the most interesting, for it includes such dangerous poisons as tobacco, deteria, atropa belladonna, deadly nightshade, henbane, bittersweet, solanum dulcomera, common nightshade, solanum nigurum, and a very great many important drugs. Even the common potato contains a poisonous secretion, solanin, and it is dangerous to eat green potatoes or the foliage. Yet the tomato or love apple, so called because it was supposed to excite tender feelings, is both nutritious and delicious. Chilies and cayenne pepper, capsaicum species, are also commonly used as condiments. Such poisonous orders should, of course, be avoided, but much more dangerous are those deadly plants which appear as it were accidentally in orders which are amongst the most useful friends of man. Amongst the grasses there is the deadly darnel, Lolium tumulentum, a first cousin and not very unlike the very commonest and one of the most useful grasses, ryegrass, Lolium perine. Then, in the useful carrot order, there are such dangerous and even deadly plants as fool's parsley, water dropwort, and cowbane. Inancrocata, water dropwort, is one of the very commonest marsh and ditch plants in Great Britain. It is perfectly well known to botanists and as distinctly poisonous, yet, in 1902, a veterinary surgeon brought me some of the Turberus root to name, and told me that six fine young cows were lying dead on a neighboring farm through having eaten them. A particularly useful order of plants, the gomens say, the beans and peas, contains a few poisonous species. It is said that in every year children are sure to be killed by eating the seeds of the laburnum, and to this order belong also the calabar bean and crab's eye. The last named is only fatal when introduced below the skin in small quantities. The seed of the bitter vetched Lathyrus sativus produces paralysis of the legs in men and also in horses. The crazy or loco weed of North America is sometimes eaten by horses in the western United States. The wretched animals stagger about as if intoxicated and eventually die. Belonging to this same order is the wild tamarind or Jumbai of Jamaica, Lacona Glauca. It is a weedy-looking acacia and extremely common in all tropical countries. Dr. D. Morris thus alludes to it. Mr. Robert Russell of St. Anne's informs me that horses feeding on the leaves of this plant completely lose the hair from their manes and tails. This statement was supported by the testimony of so many people acquainted with the facts that there was no reason to doubt it. Many years afterwards, in December 1895, I renewed my acquaintance with the plant in the Bahamas. The plant was much more plentiful there than in Jamaica. It was, in fact, distantly encouraged in the former islands as a fodder plant. 
The people were fully aware of the singular effect it produces on horses, and added that it also affected mules and donkeys. Its effects on pigs were still more marked. These animals assumed a completely naked condition, and appeared without a single hair on their body. Horses badly affected by Jumbai were occasionally seen in the streets of Nassau, where they were known as cigar tails. Such dilapidated animals, although apparently healthy, were considerably depreciated in value. They were said to recover when fed exclusively on corn and grass. The new hair was, however, of a different color and texture, so the animals were never quite the same. One animal was cited as having lost its hoofs as well, and in consequence it had to be kept in slings until they grew again and hardened. The effect of the jumbai on the horses, mules, and donkeys, and pigs were regarded as accidental, due to neglect or ignorance. The plant was really encouraged to supply food for cattle, sheep, and goats. The latter greedily devoured it and were not perceptibly affected by it. It will be noticed that the animals affected were non-ruminants, while those not affected were ruminants. The probable explanation is that the ruminants, by thoroughly mixing the food with saliva and slowly digesting it, were enabled to neutralize the action of the poison and escape injury. The seeds probably contain deleterious principle in a greater degree than any other part of the plant. It is a common experience that animals introduced from other localities suffered more than the native animals. The latter were either immune or had learnt to avoid the plant as noxious to them. That animals resident in a district are not poisoned by plants which are often fatal to sheep and cattle when on the march through it, as have been often observed in Australia. The great mobs or droves of sheep passing slowly on their travels through the bush to a new district are often poisoned by the caustic creeper, Euphorbia dramondi. The head swells to an enormous extent, becoming so heavy that the animal cannot support it and drags it along the ground. But this does not apparently happen to resident cattle. Similarly, for the darling pea or indigo, Swainsona galgifolia, at one place this was growing abundantly where some traveling horses were hobbled for the night. They had been on the road some nine weeks and were up to this state caught without any difficulty. On this occasion, their eyes were staring out their heads, prancing against trees and shrubs. When driven, they would suddenly stop, turn around and round, and keep throwing their heads up as if they had been hit under the jaw. Two out of nine died, and five others had to be left at camp. In other natural orders, we find one or two dangerous plants amongst a whole series of harmless plants or useful forms. The oleander in the olive order, corn cockle, lynchness floscuculi in the pink order, lacuca scariola amongst compositae, and others are all case in point. So also it is the yew amongst the conferaceae, etc. How do animals recognize these particular plants as being dangerous whilst all their allies are harmless? But the reader will answer that they do not. It is well known that animals are killed by eating poisonous plants. Therefore, poison cannot possibly be any protection against animals. This is one of those interesting questions in which the suppression of apparently irrelevant details produces confusion. As a matter of fact, wild animals, or even domesticated animals in nearly a wild state, do not eat the poisonous plants of the country in which, in which they and their forefathers have been brought up, that is, provided that they are either adults or are accompanied by full-grown animals. Almost every case of cattle poisoning in, in Great Britain occurs when young calves, foals, or lambs are turned loose in fields without any mature older head amongst them. Sometimes valuable stable-bred animals are lost, especially by eating yew leaves, but there are exceedingly few instances of full-grown cattle being caught in such foolishness. When cattle, horses, or sheep are turned loose in a new country, plenty of cases do occur, and it is possible that they might make mistakes with their unknown foreign plants, which had escaped into their pastures here. But almost every case of poisoning, even of cattle, shows that it is young cattle who foolishly eat foxgloves, dropwort, buttercup, etc., and occasionally die thereby. Wild animals, who are of course brought up by their mothers, never seem to be poisoned. They probably recognize the dangerous plant by color, smell, or taste. As a matter of fact, many are rendered conspicuous by some lurid sort of color, such as bright red or purple. 
There is a general garishness of appearance about many of them, aconite, foxglove, her in Paris, henbane, and nightshades all show this peculiar appearance. In Java, it is said that the natives keep away wild pigs by planting hedges of certain species with purplish-red leaves around their plantations. Perhaps the most interesting point of all is that it seems to be quite justifiable to conclude that animals do, somehow, manage to tell their offsprings and each other what they should and should not eat. Youth, with its tendency to rash experiment, is thus kept in check by the mature experience of age. But it must be admitted that it is exceedingly difficult to arrive at the fact in any particular case. I shall be rash enough to give an opinion as to the actual facts in connection with the common yew, Taxus peccatic. The seeds are poisonous to poultry and pheasants, but the fleshy part round the seed is eaten with impunity by many wild birds, blackbirds, etc. The leaves are sometimes poisonous and even fatal to horses, cattle, sheep, donkeys, and goats, but they are not eaten by or are harmless to roe deer. When, however, example, horses are killed by eating you, it is generally found that they have been grazing on cut-off branches which have been left lying on the ground. In this condition, probably some specially poisonous substance is developed in them. As regards rabbits, it would be extremely comforting to believe that they would eat yew leaves or anything else which would kill them, but, so far as one can judge, they eat all sorts of things which ought to do so with perfect impunity. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of The Romance of Plant Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emma Stays The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Elliot Chapter 19 On Fruits Bright Colors of Fruits Unripe Fruits and Their Effects An Intemperate Fungus oranges, prickly pear and the monkey, strong seeds, bill of fare of certain birds, a wood pigeon and beans, ants and seeds, bats, rats, bears, and baboons, the rise and weight of a big gooseberry, Mr. Gideon and the wealthy apple, crossing fruit, breadfruit and banana, dates, figs, olives, pineapples by the acre, apples and pears, home and Canadian orchards. At Christmas time and during late autumn, there is but little color in the country. Most green grasses have become a dull grayish green, and the leafless brown and gray branches of the tree are not, at first sight, particularly interesting. Amongst this monotony of sober coloring, points of bright red or flaming scarlet may be noticed here and there. Sometimes it is a spray of hips, the fruit of the rose, or it may be a cluster of hawthorn berries. At Christmas the holly is positively gaudy with its bright scarlet fruit, set off by the shining dark green leaves. Most fruits are some shade of red, but every fruit is conspicuous and easily seen. There is the most extraordinary range in color. The snowberry and dwarf cornel are pure white. The mistletoe is a yellowish green. Pure yellow fruits are not common, but some of the cucumber orders and lemons are lemon or orange yellow. The bluish black of the blayberry or bilberry, of the bramble and of many plums and prunes, goes along with a rather particular shade of green in the leaves which sets them off. The black elderberries, on the other hand, have bright red or pink stalks, which contrast prettily with them. The colors of apples vary. Many of them have rendered a gorgeous glossy red through cultivation. One of the most beautiful colors contrasts in nature is found in the rich black of the olive with its background of shining white pigs and silver green leaves. Another curious harmony is that of the spindle tree fruit, which has a hard dull red case that opens to display the seeds. These are enclosed in a bright orange fleshy cup. Changes often occur. The lily of the valley fruit is at first green, then becomes flecked with red, and finally is a rich scarlet. Juniper berries change from green to purple. Now there is always some meaning in nature for any series of facts such as these. 
why are these fruits so brightly colored and so conspicuous birds and other animals are intended to scatter the fruits and seeds and so the fruit must be easily distinguished at a distance the seeds are taken to some other place where they germinate and form a new plant this furnishes the clue and guide to many other peculiarities in fruits and seeds the pleasant smell of ripe apples plums strawberries and other fruits also attract birds and other animals but the sugary juice and delicious flesh is developed entirely for the purpose of making it worth a bird's while to eat it the amount of sugary matter is enormous and the seed seems very small and inconspicuous compared with this luscious mass the sugar is produced very rapidly towards the end of the ripening period cucurbita fruit for instance may increase in weight at the rate of thirty two ounces per minute all of who have gathered strawberries know how quickly they ripen the way in which the sugar is formed is not understood but unripe fruits contain bitter unwholesome acids and essences which may produce colic or very unpleasant effects if the fruit are eaten green thus the color is a guide to the animal who is not supposed to eat the fruit until it is ripe if eaten green the seeds inside the fruit are quite destroyed and cannot germinate yet animals are so greedy that young birds young animals of all sorts even girls and boys will and do eat green and half-ripe fruits in this present year there is no doubt that many children have suffered for having done this yet if we come to think of it throughout all the millions of years during which fruits have ripened nature has every year clearly told young pterodactyls and other lizards young birds young monkeys and young people to wait till the fruit is ripe none of them have learnt to do so when investigating by experiment on the vile body the properties of plums strawberries and other fruits you are sure to find here and there one that has decayed and become rotten in most cases this is because a bird has pecked a hole in it or because the outside skin has been broken by a wasp the sugar has then begun to ferment why does it do so if you gather a few fruits put them into a jar of sugar water and leave it after closing the mouth with a bunch of cotton wool then in a day or two fermentation begins and alcohol is produced that is because on the outside of the fruit there were hundreds of an objectionable little fungus it lives upon sugar and turns the latter into alcohol this yeast fungus is really a living distillery it lives in the midst of alcohol all its life dying eventually like the duke of clarence and his butt of malmsey wine by alcoholic poisoning which has brought about it by its own work this little yeast fungus can only be seen with a microscope from a rotten fruit it drops on to the ground where it remains all winter next spring certain little insects green flies and the like carry some of these yeast from the earth to next year's fruits but the skin of the plum or apple or the hairs on a gooseberry or the delicate waxy bloom on a grape will prevent these insects or wasps from laying open the sugar inside the fruit to the attacks of yeast and other fermenting fungi some fruit appear to have favorites they seem to prefer that large animals should eat them if you look carefully at a piece of orange peel and cut a small piece across you will see distinctly small resin pits full of a curious essence which gives a characteristic taste to marmalade this bitter stuff will prevent wasps from touching the sugar it is however a valuable material and some kinds of lemons etc are grown chiefly for this oil which is obtained by scraping the peel with a little saucer which is studded with short pins a still more extraordinary fruit is the prickly pear this is very delicious though very difficult to eat indeed only monkeys and man seem to enjoy it the sugary part and the seed form a little round mass in the inside the outside part though also fleshy contains hundreds of minute mineral needles which stick in the tongue and lips and cause most painful inflammation the monkey eats the prickly pear with very great caution getting his fingers into the top and scooping out the sugary part man requires a teaspoon to do this satisfactory another very curious point about these fleshy fruits and also ordinary ones is the strength of the seed inside it does not look very strong but an orange seed for instance will not be in the least injured if you put it between two glass plates and gradually press upon the upper one up to even a pressure of some thirty pounds even hemp seed which seems quite weak will endure a weight of four pounds it is impossible to break a prune stone or injure a date stone by standing with your whole weight upon it 
such strength is necessary because many of these seeds are eaten by birds and ground up in their crops with bit of china stone shells and the like which the birds pick up just to help them in crushing their foods fruits and seeds would seem to be exposed to some danger when they are lying on the ground horses or other heavy animals might tread on them but the strength of the seed and their shape is such that no harm is likely to accrue for instance i arranged a thin layer of garden earth a quarter of an inch thick on a glass plate upon the earth i placed four hemp seeds then i put a fifty-eight pound weight on the top of the seeds they were not in the least injured although the seed of the hemp is not a particularly tough one under such conditions the seeds simply slip into the earth this is made easy for it on account of its shape which is generally rounded above and below a transverse section of a seed would be in shape like the arch of a bridge in its shadow in the water at least in many cases there are also usually wonderfully thickened cells in the shell or coat of a seed which makes it tough and strong the following are a few cases of strong seeds or fruits cotton seeds bears a weight of nineteen to twenty pounds the hard fruit of the dog rose thirty three pounds castor oil seed seventeen pounds horn beam nuts twenty seven pounds pine seeds various sorts from eleven to twenty two pounds yew seeds sixteen pounds peas fifty to fifty six pounds in every case they are not at all hurt by these pressures as regards the animals for whom fruit or seeds are of great importance birds are of course the commonest the following is part of the bill of fare of a few of our common birds thrushes eat blayberries bilberries brambles and mulberries mistle thrush or mavis is especially fond of mistletoe now the berry of the mistletoe is exceedingly sticky and glutinous and in the course of the bird's meal these sticky strings get on the bills and feathers so that the mavis wipes its bills on the branch of a tree when it does so the seed becomes attached to the branch and is drawn close to the latter when the viscous matter dries up and so takes root on the branch nightingales and robins eat strawberries and elderberries blackbirds are very fond of strawberries gooseberries and raspberries wood pigeons eat beech mast acorns and according to pliny mistletoe berries also but this latter author has not been confirmed by later observers some of the wild african pigeons are exceedingly fond of castor oil seeds when travelling through the central african bush it is often necessary to shoot your dinner if you are to have any at all and castor oil bushes can be relied upon to produce pigeons if you are content with and able to shoot them there is a widely spread belief in the country that a great quantity of berries mean that a very severe winter is going to follow but as a matter of fact the winter of nineteen o four was not a severe one and yet there were enormous quantities of berries we are still ignorant of many details about birds and berries it is not quite clear how the seeds are not destroyed though experiments have shown that they are not injured by passing through the body of a bird kerner von merillon for instance tried the fruits and seeds of two hundred and fifty plants which were offered to seventeen birds as well as to marmots horses cattle and pigs he found that from seventy five to eighty eight per cent of the seeds germinated afterwards so far as regards to the blackbird song thrush rock thrush and robin quail also bring seeds from greece and the ionian islands to sicily mr clement reed says some years ago i found in an old chalk pit the remains of a wood pigeon which had met with some accident its crop was full of broad beans all of which were growing well under ordinary circumstances they would have been digested and destroyed such accidents are common but it is not only birds which eat fleshy fruits and seeds even the tiny industrious ant drags about seeds of certain plants sometimes they gather up corn or grasses such as ant rice and store them for use in winter they even bite off the growing root to prevent the seeds germinating and spoiling occasionally seem to carry the seeds by accident as for example those of the cow wheat and few others which resemble their cocoons in size color and form in other cases there is a little fleshy excrescence on the seed which they are fond of eating cyclamen snowdrop violet and periwinkle seeds are supposed to be carried in this way many animals occasionally or regularly eat fruit there are for instance the flying foxes or fruit-eating bats of madagascar and tropical countries which may be seen hanging from the upper branches of trees by their toes with their heads tucked away under their wings 
When disturbed, a little fox-like head appears, and after much chattering, scolding, and expostulation, the creature unhooks itself and flies away with a strong flight, not unlike that of the crow. Horses are occasionally fed on peaches and chili. Rats eat coffee cherry and do a great deal of harm in coffee plantations. In Casimir, the mulberry and other fruit trees are sometimes visited by sportsmen, who often find bears feeding on its fruits. Pigs, of course, eat all sorts of fruits, and several other mammals do the same, but it is especially monkeys that live chiefly on fruit. They plunder the banana plantations, and in South Africa, melon patches require to be most carefully watched to prevent baboons from destroying them. It is said that baboons watch the plantations from a distance and will only come down if they think no one is there. So five people walk to the patch and while well, four go away again, one of them remains in hiding to shoot the baboons, who cannot tell the difference between four and five. Man himself is and always has been a great eater of fruit. Not only so, but he has enormously improved and altered wild fruits until they are modified into monsters of the most extraordinary kind. The ordinary wild gooseberry weighs about five pennyweights, but even in the year 1786, some of the cultivated forms weighed double this amount, ten pennyweights, and in 1852, gooseberries, which weighed more than 37 pennyweights, were in existence. What size the largest big gooseberry may be this year is not easy to say, because the public press is at slack times too energetic about the question. The most usual way of improving fruits is by selecting the finest specimens for reproduction. It is by this means that original wild banana, which is a rather small fruit, with very large seeds and very little flesh, has been altered to something like 150 varieties, of which the immense majority have no seeds at all. This is a very extraordinary fact because the seed is the reason for the existence of the fruit. Of course, all such varieties must be reproduced by suckers, like the banana, or by grafts, or in some such non-sexual manner. Seedless varieties exist of cucumber, fig, German medlar, diasporos, and orange. In the case of seedless varieties of the vine, it has been found that it is necessary to carry pollen to the flowers to fertilize them, and the seedless fruit is also very much smaller in this case, not more than a quarter of the size of one that has seeds. The following instance is typical of the manner in which many well-known kinds of fruits have been developed, though the perseverance shown by Mr. Gideon is certainly not common. About the year 1855, this gentleman began planting apple trees of about 30 named varieties. For nine years, he continued his experimentations. He not only planted trees, but also sowed apple trees sufficient to produce a thousand trees every year. Yet, the cold winters were so severe that at the end of ten years, one small seedling crop apple was a solitary survivor. One seedling of this turned out to be hardy enough for the climate of Minnesota, and this, the wealthy apple, has been great importance to the northern Mississippi growers. It is to be the hope that the name has been justified in Mr. Gideon's case. Many other cases could be mentioned of a chance variety produced as a wild plant and then propagated non-sexually for long periods of time. An example, the new Rochelle Bramble, which was found by the roadside and which turned out to be exceedingly valuable. It is by crossing or hybridizing that the most extraordinary results have been obtained. Sometimes with plums, the hybrids of the first generation are nearly double the size of their parents. Some of the crosses are between different plants. The loganberry, for instance, is said to be a cross between a raspberry and a bramble. It ripens in July, is said to be far in advance of either of its parents as regards to juiciness and acidity. In most cases, however, the crosses are between well-established varieties or races of the same species, and both hybridizing and selection are employed to get the desired results. There are several tropical plants which, with the possible exception of wheat and oats, are more important to mankind than anything else. The breadfruit, Artocarpus incisus, which is very common in the South Sea Islands, has a large fruit the size of a melon. When baked in an oven heated by hot stones, it forms a satisfying meal. It is rather like a new bread, but has very little flavor. Coarse cloth is made out of its bark, and the wood is used as timber. The tree also has a milky juice containing indier rubber, and is employed for the caulking of the canoes. The most interesting point for botanists about this plant is that the fruit is made of thousands of little flowers, and the fleshy part is really the stalk. Fossil trees of this genus of the chalk period are found in some parts of Europe. Still more important to mankind is the banana, Musa paradisica, 
It is wheat, corn, and potatoes all in one, in tropical and subtropical countries. It is found all over the world whenever there is a hot, moist climate and shelter from the wind. It is a most generous plant as regards the amount which it will produce. It will yield about 19 and a half tons of dry fruit on a single acre, which is about 44 times the amount given by potatoes and 133 times that of wheat. Moreover, it differs from almost every other fruit in being both rice and prunes. That is, it is nutritious and wholesome, and yet at the same time succulent. There are people, there are still people who declare that the taste is that of cotton wool and Windsor soap, but that is a frivolous and unjust remark. It is very difficult to prepare it exactly in the right way for export to Great Britain, and the slightest change in temperature or period of gathering has the most distressing results. As with many other tropical fruits, the countries where it is most carefully produced and where the trade is most important are just on the borders of the tropics. There, Europeans can keep enough vigor and vitality to supervise and watch over the labor of the natives. It is in the Canary Islands, Queensland, and Jamaica that the cultivation is most carefully looked after. The yield may be from 500 to 1,000 bunches per acre, and the value of the trade is enormous. A plantation is not very beautiful because the huge leaves break up into irregular ragged pieces which look untidy. The flowers are visited by beautiful little honey-sucking sunbirds and hummingbirds. Monkeys are also very fond of the fruit. In the tropics, it grows everywhere, and with extremely little trouble. It is a doubtful blessing to the Negroes, for they tend to get their food so easily that they tend to become incorrigibly lazy. Jam, champagne, brandy, and meal can be made from the banana. When this meal can be prepared satisfactorily, it may partly replace wheat in temperate countries. Besides this, the leaves are used for thatching, and the stalks which make the stem contain a valuable fiber, which is used for string and rope. In Egypt and all along the great deserts of Sahara, in Asia, the grateful stately date palm gives the favorite food of the people. The Arabs grind up the stones to make food for camels, and sometimes ferment the sap to make toddy. The trees are either male or female. The Arabs knew that it was necessary to pollinate the female flowers with male pollen long before the meaning of the process was realized in Europe. The fig, a native of the Persian Gulf, is cultivated all along the Mediterranean in, in India, Australia, and California. It is sometimes 15 to 30 feet high, and reaches a very great age. There is one at Finisterre, said to be several centuries old. It yields fruit worth about 14 pounds an acre. The most interesting point about the fig is the way in which the fig wasp carries the pollen. See chapter 5. Olives are also one of the most important and characteristic Mediterranean trees. The crop in both Spain and Italy is worth about 8 million pounds to 9 million pounds annually. In California, it is also successfully cultivated and pays very well. The particular taste of the dessert olive is obtained by soaking it in lime or potash, and then in vinegar or salt. The pineapple is one of the most delicious fruits and is interesting in every way. The little sharp spines on the edge of the leaves keep animal off and also make it a little difficult to harvest. The workmen must wear leather trousers to prevent their being cut and torn by leaves. In Queensland, the pineapple is grown in big fields and about 10,000 fruits, worth about one penny each, can be got from a single acre. It is also grown in the West Indies and in India and other tropical countries. If you examine the horny outside skin of the fruit with a sharp penknife, you will find that each little piece of the mosaic is a flower in itself. With a little care, the bracts, three sepals, three petals, and six stamens can be distinguished. The whole stem and all of its flowers unite to make a compound fruit. Most varieties have no seeds. It is a native of South America. It is, however, our home fruits. Apples, pears, gooseberries, strawberries, raspberries, and currants that are most important to us in Britain. The wild crab apple is found from Drontheim in Norway to the Caucasus and grown over the whole of Europe. Apples were known to the Greeks and Romans. Unfortunately, in our own climate, there are great dangers in the orchard. A touch of frost when the flowers are ripe will very likely kill the tender green baby apple. It is perhaps in Canada and North America that the growing of apples and pears is most carefully looked after. Our beautiful old orchards in Devonshire and other places, with comfortable grass below the trees and moss-covered, picturesque ancient trunks are not found in the New World. 
the regular lines of young trees and bare, carefully kept earth, with every stem whitewashed and treated with the most scientific monotony, produced a most valuable return. But in this country, those who are careful and scientific sometimes obtain extraordinary results. It is on record that a man with a holding of 29 acres near Birmingham made 600 pounds a year from a small plot and paid 250 pounds for labor on it. Mr. Gladstone also said that the future of British farmers depended upon jam. Yet it must be remembered that the trees make a long time to come into bearing, and the crop is most uncertain. End of chapter 19《Chapter Twenty of The Romance of Plant Life》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon.《The Romance of Plant Life》by George Francis Scott Elliot. Chapter Twenty: Wandering Fruits and Seeds. Ships and stowaway seeds. Tidal drift. Sheep, broom, migrating birds, crows and eggcorns, ice, squirrels, long flight of birds, seeds and mud, martinia and lions, the wanderings of xanthium, coconut and South Sea islands, sedges and floods, lichens of Arctic and Antarctic, manna of Bible, the tumbleweeds of America, catapult and sling fruits, cow parsnips, Parachutes, shuttlecocks, and kites. Cotton. The use of hares and wings. Monkey's dinner bell. Sheep killing grasses. The ways in which fruits and seeds are scattered abroad over the face of the earth form one of the most fascinating chapters in the story of plant life. There is an infinite number of ingenious contrivances, so many indeed that it is not at all easy to explain them. However, Suppose yourself seated on a grassy cliff near Eastbourne or Brighton. Looking lazily out over the blue waters, you see Norwegian timber ships and steamers of all kinds, from the little coasting puffing billy to the huge liner departing for Australia or South Africa. Plants are probably using every steamer, in the straw of the packing cases, in the cargoes of corn or grain, in the ore, and in the ballast there are sure to be seeds. Such stowaways are mostly weeds, but of course many valuable garden, farm, orchard, and forest seeds are being intentionally exported. Looking down on the seashore, you will notice the high water mark, a yellowish-brown line of floated rubbish which is quite distinct even at a distance. If you now go down and examine it closely, not a particularly pleasant operation, seeing that so much is in a decomposing condition, you will find many seeds amongst the corks and bits of straw, seaweed, and objectionable, if lively, animalcula, and very likely also pieces of plants, such as willow branches, which might quite easily take root. On the coast of Norway, and on our own western seaboard, the fruits of a West Indian bean, Entata scandens, are occasionally to be found, and its seeds are probably able to germinate. We know that in long past geological ages, they were floating round the estuary of the Thames, where they occur as fossils. It has been found by experiment that fruits and seeds are not killed, although they have floated for a year or more in salt water. Thus ocean currents are utilized to carry fruits and seeds. But from our comfortable seat on the South Downs, still more can be learnt of wandering seeds. The wind which blows across the downs carries with it hundreds of winged or hairy fruits, all of them exquisitely fashioned as miniature airships, airplanes, or other winged contrivances. The wind is an important distributor of seeds. One of the South Down sheep is trailing behind it a piece of bramble, which is caught in its wool. Others, which have been grazing on the broken cliff edge where agrimony, forget-me-not, and burdock are flourishing, are certain to have spiny or sticky fruits entangled in their wool. Animals, therefore, carry seeds in their wool or fur. If it should happen to be a fine, sunny afternoon, and if there are any plants of broom nearby, it is quite likely that you may, every now and then, hear a faint, sudden crack. This will be the broom at work, scattering its seeds by itself. The little pod, when it dries, contracts in such a way that it splits with a sudden explosive pop, and the seeds are sent flying to a distance of three or four feet. 
This curious fact was observed in 1546 by the naturalist Boak. The whin and many other plants act in the same way, for the dry fruit becomes elastic and coils up spirally, flinging away the seed. But here also, on the southern shore of England, we are at a main station of arrival and departure for migrating birds. A landrail or other marsh bird might be flushed in France, and might quite easily cross the channel with French mud sticking to its plumage. In this mud, or in its crop, there may be seeds or fruit which will be left in an English pond. This method is probably a very important one, for these plants growing in duck-haunted places are amongst the most widely distributed of all. Mr. Reed has a very interesting discussion on this point. The crow or rook could quite well cross the British Channel now. In the days when Britain was covered with ice and snow, the gap between the French and the English shore was only half the present width. There was, at that time, much flat land with oak forest bordering the French coast. Mr. Reed shows that it is probable that rooks regularly carry about acorns in the cup, for he found seedling oaks associated with empty acorn husks, stabbed and torn in a peculiar way. On October 29th of 1895, in the middle of an extensive field bordered by an oak copse and scattered trees, I saw a flock of rooks feeding and passing singly backwards and forwards to the oaks. On driving the birds away and walking to the middle of the field, I found hundreds of empty acorn husks and a number of half-eaten, pecked acorns, so that crows may have brought the acorns that colonized Britain with oak forest in the earliest historical period. Another means of dispersal is not so obvious on the South Downs. In the Arctic region, a glacier breaks away at its tongue into icebergs, which float off and are stranded somewhere perhaps hundreds of miles distant. Upon these icebergs are stones and soil and plants, which may be carried to a great distance from their original place. In the glacial period or Great Ice Age, ice may have been an important help in distributing plants, but at present it is difficult to find a good example. From all this it is clear that in order to carry plants to new countries and new homes, everything that moves on the earth's surface can be employed. Not only the wind, but ocean currents, river waters, icebergs, and floating ice are used. Migrating birds, mammals, and especially the most restless and unsettled animal of all, viz. man, are at work consciously and deliberately, or unconsciously and accidentally, carrying the seeds to form new forest, grasslands, or harvests in other countries. The subject is, in truth, so vast that it is difficult to select the most interesting and important cases. The way in which squirrels, rats, voles, and lemmings devour nuts and the like often leads to the distribution of the fruit. A squirrel may, like a human being, forget where its store was buried, or be driven from the place. Then some of those forgotten nuts will grow into trees. Birds are known to travel enormous distances. It is said that one little arctic bird travels from Heligoland to Morocco in a single flight. It would not, at first sight, seem likely that seeds and fruits could be carried by birds. Yet Darwin saw that this might possibly be the case. The mud and slime in which so many birds find the small insects which they require is full of seeds. An Austrian botanist, Kerner von Marillon, examined the mud scraped from the beaks, feathers, and legs of a number of wading and marsh birds. He found in it the seeds of no less than 31 different water and marsh plants, grasses, sedges, toad rush, etc., this showed, as is very often the case, that Darwin was the first to discover a very important point. It is also interesting to find that these ugly little freshwater mud and marsh plants are at home almost everywhere, from the Arctic Circle to Tierra del Fuego, and from Peru to Japan. The most extraordinary cases known of sticking fruits and spines are the Martinias and Harpagophytans of South Africa. The fruit is covered by hooked claws and becomes a regular pest wherever it occurs. Deer, antelopes, and other animals get their hoofs entangled in the fruit, and the wretched creatures have to limp about until the hard, thorny fruit is trodden to pieces. Dr. Livingstone says that the fruit gets into the nostrils of grazing animals, which cannot possibly remove it themselves, and so have to wait patiently till the herdsman comes to take it out. According to Lord Avebury, 
Lions may sometimes be destroyed by these horrible fruits. When a lion is rolling on the sand, the claws, an inch long, stick in his skin, and when the lion tries to tear it away with his teeth, his mouth gets full of the fruits and he cannot eat, and perishes miserably of starvation. Some of our common British fruits are most perfectly planned to stick or entangle themselves in the wool of sheep or in people's clothes. These, such as the goose grass, robin run the hedge, burdock, forget-me-not, sanical, avens, etc., have very often been described. It is only necessary to examine one's clothes after a walk through rough, broken ground to discover some of them, and the ingenuity and neatness of their tiny hooks, harpoons, or prongs can then be realized. We shall give one or two instances of some other spiny plants. There is, for instance, xanthium, which is one of the daisy flowers or composites. Unlike most of this order, its little fruits possess no wind hairs. The outside of the head of flowers is covered by strong, curved little crooks. These get so entangled in wool or hair that they become a perfect pest to wool merchants. In 1814, xanthium was unknown in the Crimea, but by 1856 it had covered the whole of the peninsula. In 1828, the Russian cavalry horses brought it on their manes and tails into Wallachia, from whence it traveled to Serbia. Serbian pigs carried it into Hungary. In 1830, it was taken in wool to Vienna. By 1871, it had reached Paris and Edinburgh. In 1860, Frauenfeld saw horses in Chile whose manes and tails were so felted together with thousands of these fruits that the animals could scarcely walk. In Australia, where it first appeared in 1850, it has caused a very serious loss to the wool merchants and squatters. The loss has been put at 50% by some authorities. We have already alluded to the transference of fruits and seeds by ocean currents. In the Challenger expedition, no less than 97 kinds of marine floating fruits were observed. Amongst these, the most important is the coconut. The nut sold in this country is not the whole fruit, but only the inside shell. In the natural state, this is enclosed in a dense mass of fibers, which form the valuable coir used for brush making and a variety of purposes. The entire outside of the fruit is covered by a smooth white skin. The whole fruit is about the size of a man's head and is so light that it floats easily in the water. It has in fact been carried by the waves to uninhabited islands all over the South Seas. It is a very great blessing to Polynesia, for a tree yields 30 to 50 nuts, and four of these nuts will furnish enough food for one day. Copra and the oil extracted by boiling the inside are also valuable. Spirit or toddy can be made from the young buds. The leaves are used for thatching and the trunk for timber. There are other very curious palm fruits which are also carried by water. Sir Joseph Hooker mentions the large, round fruits of Nipa, as big as a cannonball, turned over by the paddles of the steamer in the muddy waters at the Ganges mouth. Himalayan Journal. In this country, a search in the rubbish left by a spate or freshet along a riverside is sure to furnish many floating fruits or seeds. Most of these are small and rather difficult to see. Perhaps the most interesting are those of the sedges. The real fruit is only about one sixteenth of an inch in size, but it is enclosed in a little sack or bag a quarter of an inch long and with a narrow opening, so that it floats quite easily. Many willow branches, pond weeds, horn weeds, and the like are also found in the rubbish left by floods, and these can often take root. It is, however, in the exquisite modifications of those fruits which are blown by the wind that we find the most beautiful contrivances of all. They are effective also. Seeds are often so small as to be like dust particles, and such may be carried in the air to almost incredible distances. That of Goodyera repens weighs only one two hundred millionth of a pound. That of Monotropa, point zero 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 six pounds. It is no doubt by the wind that the spores of lichens are carried from one mountain to another. On a map of the world, the distance from the Arctic to the Antarctic, between the North and South Poles, seems enormous. Moreover, the amount of water, desert, tropical forest, and cultivated land in this extent of country is very great. There are but few rocks on which lichens could manage to grow. And yet, of the Antarctic lichens in the South Polar regions, 
and which are also European species, more than 73% are found in the Arctic or North Polar regions. An Arctic lichen spore probably traveled from Scandinavia to the German and Swiss Alps. Another journey took it to the Atlas Mountains, thence to Abyssinia, again to Mount Kenya, and from there, somehow, it wandered to the South Orkneys or King Edward VII land. While talking of lichens, one must not forget the manna of the Bible, Lecanora esculenta, and two other species which form warted, wrinkled masses on rocks. It breaks off and may be carried away by the wind, or in heavy rain it may be washed into depressions of the soil, where a man can pick up 8 to 12 pounds in a day. It is used as a substitute for corn in years of famine, being ground in the same way and baked into bread. It is also remarkable that all the great so-called rains of manna, of which news has come from the east to Europe, especially those of the years 1824, 1828, 1841, 1846, 1863, and 1864, occurred at the beginning of the year, between January and March, i.e. at the time of the heaviest rains. The inhabitants of the district actually thought that the manna had fallen from heaven, and quite overlooked the fact that this vegetable structure grew and developed, although only in isolated patches and principally as crusts on stones, in the immediate neighborhood of the spots where they collected it. Amongst the wind-blown fruits and seeds, there are cases in which entire plants are dragged out of the soil and hurried away by the wind, which rolls them over and over. They may be blown along for days altogether. The seeds drop out by the way. In this country, one rarely sees anything of the sort, but in the prairies of North America, when under cultivation, these tumbleweeds are a serious and expensive pest. Sometimes the farmers dig trenches to catch them, or they may put up fences against which the tumbleweeds become piled or heaped up until they blow over the top. It is not very much use to give the names of these weeds, for they are mostly rare or not British species. Such tumbleweeds are generally nearly spherical in general form, and have a short, rather weak root, which is easily torn out of the ground. In some grasses, such as Old Witch, a well-known pest of the United States, the grass stalk, with many flowers on it, is pulled out of its sheath and blown away but it is more usual for the fruits or seeds themselves to break off the parent plant and to be carried away by the wind. To this end we find the most extraordinary changes. Although the flower may droop from its stalk, the latter becomes upright and grows quite a considerable length when the seed or fruit is dispatched on its wanderings. This will raise the fruit or seed as high as possible above the surrounding grasses. Then, in some cases, the fruit opens to allow the seed to escape. Small holes appear on it, or the fruit splits. As the dry, elastic, withered stalk swings to and fro in the wind, the seeds are swung out of these openings, and starting with a certain momentum, the wind will carry them often to a surprising distance from their parents. In wet or rainy weather, these holes or slits generally close together, and no seeds are sent forth on their travels. The little holes in the top of a poppy head, by which the seeds are swung out, have little flaps which close over and shut them up in wet weather. Some plants make a sort of catapult to sling or hurl their fruits. Kerner von Marillon was the first to describe some of these curious arrangements. He had brought home some fruits of Durichnium herbaceum and laid them on his writing table. Next day, as I sat reading near the table, one of the seeds of the durichnium was suddenly jerked with great violence into my face. Some of the neatest catapult fruits are those of Teucrium flavum. There is a British species, the wood sage, but it has not got the same arrangement. When the petals have fallen off, the four small fruits are left inside the cup-like sepals. The flower stalk, when dry, is very elastic, and if an animal touches the sepals, it swings violently and shoots out one of the fruits but that is by no means the whole of the process. There are hairs arranged spirally in the throat of the sepals, and these give a spin or twirling motion like that of a rifle bullet to the fruit. The fruit also flies out of the sepals in a line of flight which is inclined at an angle of about 45 degrees to the horizon. At this angle, as is well known, the trajectory or distance traveled will be the greatest possible. But by far the best way to understand these questions is to try with some common weeds in the country towards the end of summer or beginning of autumn. 
If either the cow parsnip or wild angelica or mirus be gathered and kept till it is quite dry, then if you take it by the stalk and swing it to the full extent of the arms, the fruits fly off to fifteen or more feet away. Every part is elastic, not only the main stalk, but the thin separate stalks of the flowers, and also the delicate piece by which each half-fruit is attached. The half-fruits themselves are also made so that they are of exactly the right shape to take a long flight. Ever since the days of Icarus, one of the unsatisfied ambitions of mankind has been to fly like a bird, to soar into the Empyrean, and to be no longer chained to the Earth's surface. It is a very curious study, that of the many and diverse inventions, almost always useless and very often fatal, by which men have endeavored to solve this problem. Every one of these can be paralleled amongst the many neat contrivances of wind-borne fruits and seeds. The principle of the parachute, which is more or less like an umbrella, is found in both fruits and seeds. One of the most beautiful is the dandelion fruit, where a series of the most exquisite branched hairs springs from the top of the slender shaft which carries the little hard fruit. Most of the composite or dandelion order have, however, more of the shuttlecock idea. There is a row or crown of stiff and spreading or feathery hairs. The classical person above alluded to seems to have copied the bird's wing, sticking on feathers with wax, which of course melted in the sun with the usual result to the inventor of flying machines. Many seeds have regular wings, which act like those of the bat or flying squirrel. One of the most exquisite of all is the seed of bignonia. The dahlia fruit has also a flying wing, and a great many others might be mentioned. Major Baden-Powell experimented with kites, which were supposed to raise a man high enough in the air to take observations of the enemy's movements. But a most exquisite kite is that of the lime tree. The little fruit is hung from a broad flying bract, and as it very slowly sinks to the ground, it solemnly turns round and round. That is because the pressure of the air acts on the flat bract just as it does on an airplane, and forces it to revolve. So the fruit remains a long time in the air and may be carried to nearly a hundred yards away from its parent tree. The traveler's joy, clematis, and the cotton have their seeds covered all over by many entangled hairs, which act like a piece of fluff, so that the wind blows the seed away. No one has discovered the original wild cotton plant. The robes of the priests in Egyptian temples were made of it. It was introduced into Spain by the Arabs when they invaded that country. When the Spaniards attacked the half-civilized Indian people of Central and South America, they found cotton was regularly cultivated there. Its history in England is rather interesting. In the days of Queen Elizabeth, the great English industry was the production of woolen cloth from Yorkshire sheep. A penalty of 20 pounds was imposed, even as late as 1720, on any person who imported or even wore cotton cloths. Yet this was unable to stop the growth of the trade, which, thanks to the Flemings and Huguenots who took refuge from religious persecution in this country, eventually became our gigantic textile industry, employing millions of factory hands. The advantage of these wings and hairs is at once seen if one compares the time that a fruit or seed takes to fall through a given height, first with its wings or hairs, and then after they have been cut off. An artichoke fruit, for instance, will take nearly eight seconds to reach the ground from a height of a few feet but if you cut away its hairs, it will touch the ground in little more than one second. A sycamore fruit, of which the wing has been removed, falls to the ground in about a quarter of the time that it takes when it has not been injured, so that the wing helps it to fly to four times the distance that it could reach if it had none. The ash fruit also remains twice as long in the air as it would do if it had no wing, and so on. We shall finish this chapter by describing two very extraordinary cases. The sandbox tree is a native of tropical America. The fruit, as large as an orange, consists of a number of rounded pieces, each with a single seed inside. When ripe, each piece splits off, making a noise like the report of a pistol. The plant is sometimes called the monkey's dinner bell. These pieces may be thrown to a distance of 57 feet from the parent plant. Even more remarkable are the hygroscopic grasses. There are four of them, which are widely separated as regards distribution. For one, Stipa capillata lives in Russia, another, Stipa spartia, in North America, a third, 
Aristida hygrometica, is found in Queensland, Australia, and the fourth, Heteropagon contortus, belongs to New Caledonia. Yet all these four grasses are said to kill sheep, and do so in a manner that is almost identical. The mechanism is as follows. The fruit is like that of most grasses, enclosed in a folded leaf, the bract or gloom, which in these particular cases is produced into a very long, fine, tapering hair or awn. This awn is sensitive to changes in the moisture of the air. It is strongly hygrometric. In wet weather it straightens itself, and it coils into corkscrew spirals in dry weather. The widened part of the base, which contains the grain, tapers into a sharp, very hard point. Upon this there are, on the outside, many stiff hairs which point backwards away from the sharp tip. Now, suppose this fruit to fall on the ground. The awn or tail is sure to be entangled in neighboring grasses or herbs, but the hard point will rest upon the ground. Every coil and twist made by the entangled awn or tail will push the point a little deeper into the earth, and the backward pointing stiff hairs will prevent it being pulled out of the soil. Therefore, all these modified contrivances ensure that the seed will bury itself. But supposing that one of these fruits falls upon a sheep's back, then an exactly similar process will go on. The seed will be forced through the skin into the body of the sheep. In fact, if it should fall above any soft or vulnerable part of the animal, the sheep will very likely be killed. As a matter of fact, sheep are said to be killed by these grasses in all those four countries, distant though they are from one another. We have endeavored in this chapter to give some faint notion of the hundreds and thousands of ingenious contrivances utilized by plants in order to ensure the dispersal and future prosperity of their children. Every species is always trying to colonize new ground, to seek fresh fields and new pastures. Plants are not content to keep to the old habitats, but every species tries to scatter its pioneers over all the neighboring country, so that, as often happens, if it is exterminated or suppressed in one locality, new generations luxuriate elsewhere. End of chapter 20. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 21 of The Romance of Plant Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Eliot. Chapter 21 Story of the Crops. Bloated and Unhealthy Plants. Oats of the Borderers, Norsemen, and Danes. Wheat as a Wild Plant. Barley rye where was the very first harvest vine in the caucasus indians sowing corn early weeds where did weeds live before cultivation armies of weeds their cunning and ingenuity gardeners feats the ideal bean diseased pineapples raising beetroot and carrot story of the travels of sugarcane Indian Cupid, Beetroot, and Napoleon. It is difficult to understand the amount of labor and toil that has been spent on farmlands and pastures if one only considers England. It is often impossible to discover one square mile still covered by the natural wild plants. It is all under corn or arable or rich artificial meadowland. But from a Scotch hillside, as one looks down at the fertile valley below, one can see first where the mosaic of hedges and dikes stops, then where, after a narrow stretch of rough grass pasture, the cultivation ends. Finally, where ridge after ridge, rolling, heathery moorland, without enclosures and without any sign of man's handiwork, rises up to the highest peaks. This fills one with a respect and reverence towards our forebears, which is increased by a study of corn, turnips, and potatoes. Every one of these plants is a thoroughly unnatural, artificially bloated and overfed sort of creature. Its constitution, as is usual with those who habitually overeat themselves, is delicate and unsound. 
no cultivated plant could exist for more than a season if man did not look after it and protect it from its rivals and weeds moreover they are a curiously assorted lot wheat probably came from asia minor swedes from scandinavia mangelwurzel from the mediterranean and potatoes from chile turnips and carrots are indeed native britishers though the original wild carrot or turnip would never be recognized as such by any ordinary person the history of every one of them is interesting the oat is the true teutonic and scandinavian grain which has more fiber than any other cereal there is an interesting passage in froissart's chronicles describing the commissariat of those hardy scotch borderers who raided and ruined the northern english counties whenever they felt inclined to do so they lived for the most part on the cattle of their enemies but each man carried a small sack of oatmeal and a griddle or iron plate on which to make oat cake so that each man supported himself his little rough pony also was quite able to look after itself that hardy plant the oat avena sativa can be cultivated as far north as sixty nine point five zero degrees north latitude it is a native of siberia and western europe it was oatmeal that supported the norsemen who conquered normandy and england and who even dominated the mediterranean the swedes of gustavus adolphus and the danes of canute also lived mainly upon oatmeal and porridge it is true that in england oats are abandoned to the horses but those horses are the best in the world there can of course be no question as to whether the scotch or english are the best the history of wheat is a very complicated one there are a great number of varieties and subspecies all closely allied to our ordinary wheat and difficult to distinguish from it one variety occurs as a wild plant from mesopotamia near ararat over servia the crimea and as far as thessaly where entire hills are covered by it this grain seems to have been cultivated at troy for dr schliemann has found it at hisarlik it was however in cultivation long before the days of achilles it was grown by the stone age people lived in the lake dwellings of switzerland another kind spelt wheat seems to have been the mainstay in ancient egypt in greece and all through the roman empire it is now very rare though it is still grown in spain and in other countries where the soil is poor grains of the true wheat have been discovered in the pyramids of egypt so that it also is very ancient today wheat extends to norway sixty nine degrees north latitude and may be grown up to four thousand four hundred feet on the alps india united states russia the argentine chile australia and many other countries produce great crops of this useful and nourishing food its fiber is three per cent albuminous matter eleven and a half per cent and carbohydrates sixty six point five per cent oat has ten per cent fiber eleven and a half per cent albuminous and fifty seven per cent carbohydrates one guess as to the origin of wheat is that the first named mesopotamian sort is the original wild plant by cultivation in the rich alluvial valleys of mesopotamia and egypt improved kinds were formed these have eventually replaced both spelt wheat and the wild race but could only do so when richly cultivated fields were ready for them on poor soil and with bad cultivation spelt is said to be even now the most profitable crop wild barley grows in arabia and from asia minor to baluchistan it is very important in the colder regions of northern europe in tibet and in china but with us john barleycorn is chiefly used for brewing rye also comes from asia minor it was not apparently known in europe until the bronze period 
but is now the chief cereal of the German and Slavonic nations. The black rye bread is familiar to all who have traveled on the continent. The straw is good fodder, and is used for making hats, and for paper. A very interesting point on which, however, it is quite impossible to come to a definite decision may be noticed here. We will suppose what is quite as likely as any other theory, viz. that man as a gardening creature first settled somewhere in the Euphrates or Caucasian valleys. What wild plants, then, would have been available for his experiments? This particular region is an interesting and remarkable one. Most of our common British plants occur along the shore of the Black Sea to the Caucasus. Apple, pear, nut, turnip, cabbage, carrot, and others are all probably to be found there. On the Babylonian side of the mountains, there is a warm subtropical climate in which almost every useful plant can be grown. The desert also contains a few other valuable plants. Near Ararat, Noah might have found rye, wheat, and barley growing wild. The wild vine also grows on the south of the Caucasus. It grows there with the luxuriant wildness of a tropical creeper, clinging to tall trees and producing abundant fruit without pruning or cultivation. In that favored district, the olive and the fig, the melon and cucumber, onions, garlic and shallots, and other common garden and medicinal plants can be found. Not far away is the native country of the camel, the ass, the horse, and most other domestic animals. Were these hillsides of Ararat or thereabouts the first place where man sowed and reaped a harvest? At any rate, in those flat, fertile, alluvial plains of the Euphrates and also in Egypt, the first great cities arose. But even in the later Stone Age, which may have been about 58,000 B.C., some of these Caucasian plants seem to have been in cultivation in Switzerland. Probably every subsequent invasion, first that of races with bronze weapons, and then of others in the Iron Age, brought with it new cultivated plants. The oat seems to be an exception to the rule, for so far as one can gather, it was not a native of Asia Minor. The first harvest was, however, in all probability, a very casual and occasional kind of thing. Mason, origin of inventions, has described such a kind of cultivation which was in existence amongst the American Indians quite recently. Quote, a company of Cocopa or Mojave or Pima women set forth to a rich and favored spot on the side of a canyon or rocky steep. They are guarded by a sufficient number of men from capture or molestation. Each woman has a little bag of gourd seed, and when the company reach their destination, she proceeds to plant the seeds one by one in a rich cranny or crevice where the roots may have opportunity to hold, the sun may shine in, and the vines with their fruit may swing down as from a trellis. The planters then go home and take no further notice of their vines until they return in the autumn to gather the gourds. End quote. E. Palmer. There is an interesting point about the cultivation of those early savage peoples who built up for themselves unhealthy but elaborate wooden dwellings in the Swiss lakes in order to escape wild beasts and human beings who were even more dangerous and ferocious than they. Weeds occurred in those cornfields, cultivated by stone implements, some 60,000 years ago. The seed of an Italian weed had been introduced with their corn and was discovered in Switzerland. Weeds are an extremely interesting group. A proverb about the hardiness and multiplication of weeds can be discovered in almost every language. Ill weeds grow apace. Unkraut verbesset nicht, and so on. They are very common. In fact, weeds, wayside, and freshwater plants have by far the widest distribution of all. 
there are 25 species which can be found over at least half the entire land surface of the earth, and more than a hundred occupy a third of it. Moreover, many of our common weeds existed in Britain when the glaciers and ice melted away, and there were as yet no people able to cultivate the ground. The creeping buttercup, chickweed, mint, persicaria, dock, and sheep's sorrel had already colonized the country before the great ice age came upon them, and at least fourteen weeds were here when the first corn-raising savages landed in Britain. At first sight, it is difficult to understand where and how they lived. One discovers a very few, however, if one botanizes very carefully along the seashore, or on river banks where landslips have occurred, and in other such places where bare ground exists which is not the result of cultivation. There these weeds fulfill a very important and useful purpose. The red smear of a landslip is soon tinted green with colt's foot, chickweed, and the like, and the bare earth, which was useless and supported no green covering, is very soon made once more a part of the earth's fruitful field. In such places, the weeds are soon overcome and suppressed by the regular woods, grass, or thicket of the district. It is far otherwise in arable land where man desires to keep the ground bare in order to give his own domestic plants the best part of the soil. Let us look for a little at what actually happens in an ordinary cornfield. It is not merely one generation of weeds but whole armies that the farmer has to contend with. When the young corn is growing up, one, the bright yellow charlock grows much more rapidly, and the whole cornfield is golden with it. The charlock grows to some 18 inches high, flowers, and sets its seed before it is suppressed by the growth of the corn stalks, which, of course, may be three or four feet or more in height. Two, Another series of weeds, such as spurry, are growing in the shelter of the tall stalks, and their flowers are ripened, and their seeds scattered long before the corn is cut. 3. Another series, such as polygonums, etc., become ripe, and are about the length of the corn, so that when it is cut and thrashed, the seed of the polygonum accompanies the grain, and is probably sown with it. 4. Then there are such weeds as the false oat grass, etc., which are taller than the oat, and whose seeds are blown off and scattered all over the field before the harvest. One would think that those exhausted the series, but far from it. The farmer cuts and carries the crop, and for two or three days the ground is almost bare. But if you revisit the field a week afterwards, you can no longer see the ground. The cut-off yellow stalks of the corn are set off by a dark, continuous green carpet of flourishing weeds. This last, five, the waiting division of the weeds, remain quietly until the corn is removed, and then get through their flowering and seeding before the field is plowed up or covered by grass. Now, if one thinks for a little over the cunning and ingenuity of these proceedings, it is obvious that each single weed has somehow learnt how to develop exactly at the right time. Those especially which are intended by themselves to form part of the seed mixtures must flower exactly at the same time as the corn. As a matter of fact, most seed mixtures are often full of weeds. In a single pound of clover seed, no less than 14,400 foreign seeds, including those of 44 different weeds, have been discovered. Others scattered on the ground will probably be buried and remain five to seven years below the surface, yet they are ready to come up flourishing as soon as they get a chance. How has this been brought about? It is only since about 1780 to 1820 that our present system of farming has prevailed. In these 125 years, 
These weeds have found out exactly how to establish themselves. The explanation is probably a very simple one. Every weed which did not bloom and seed exactly at the right time was killed and left no seed. This encouraged the others, who have gradually brought about the neat little arrangements above described. A process of selection has been at work. Those that would not modify their arrangements to suit new methods of farming have been suppressed. But it is in some of the cultivated plants themselves that one sees the most extraordinary results of selection. The wild cabbage is still to be found on sea cliffs on the southwestern coast of England, and the wild turnip occasionally occurs in fields. There is nothing particularly interesting or attractive about either of them. Yet, from the one has been produced cabbage, cauliflower, sea kale, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, and kohlrabi, and the other has given the endless varieties of turnips. For the most part, these extraordinary changes have been brought about in a perfectly straightforward way, by just choosing the biggest and finest sorts for seed. Some of the feats performed by gardeners in this way are almost incredible. A United States seedsman evolved the idea of a perfect bean from his inner consciousness. It had a particular shape which he described to a noted grower of beans. Two years later his ideal bean was produced. The growers of pineapples used to have great deal of difficulty on account of the pineapple cuttings becoming unhealthy. Sometimes 63% were more or less diseased. Then, certain growers began to carefully select disease-proof pineapples and finally reduced the percentage of diseased cuttings to 4%. Another French observer, Monsieur Rougeon, by continually selecting the smallest seeds, was able to obtain corn only 8 inches high. But by far, the most interesting and important researches have been those dealing with roots and tubers. Several people have, in fact, done in a few years what it took primitive man centuries to accomplish. Thus, in 1890, E. V. Proskovets obtained some seeds of the wild sea beetroot, which is found on the south coast of France. By very careful selection, he was able, in the year 1894, to get good beetroots quite like the ordinary cultivated ones. These were biennials, not annuals like the wild plant, and had a large percentage of sugar, 16.99%. This was by selection in good and fertile soil. Vilmorin also obtained quite good carrots in the fourth generation by cultivating the wild form in rich and good soil and selecting the best. In fact, there are in natural wild plants great differences between individuals, and when such plants are cultivated in good soil, where they have far more to eat than they require, the result is that they produce extraordinary and monstrous types. These types are, however, more or less delicate, and are weak in constitution and easily killed. To prevent such variations, those who wish to keep a race of seed pure are careful to keep it growing on poor land. In 1596, the hyacinth, Hyacinthus orientalis, was introduced from the Levant. In 1597, there were four varieties, and in 1629, eight kinds were known, but in 1768, 2,000 forms of hyacinth were named and described. Besides selection, the method of hybridizing or crossing is often used in order to obtain new or valuable strains. Generally, both hybridizing and crossing are employed. This method has long been practiced. Bradley, in 1717, writes as follows, quote, A curious person may, by this knowledge, produce much rare kinds of plants as have not yet been heard of, end quote. And in fact, peaches, potatoes, plums, strawberries, and savoys 
have all been greatly improved by hybridizing and selection. By crossing certain kinds of corn, such as the Chinese oat and the wild European oat, varieties have been produced by Messrs. Garten, which at the Highland and Agricultural Society's trials produced 84, 87, and 99 bushels per acre, as compared with 58 bushels yielded by the ordinary Scotch oat. With potatoes also, astonishing results have been got. One single potato was sold for 50 pounds not very long ago. The potato, like the Indian corn, tobacco, and a few other plants, is an inhabitant of the New World. Of other cultivated plants, the native country is not known. No one knows where, for instance, sugar cane was first cultivated, but it has nine Sanskrit names, one of which, Khand, is or has probably at one time been familiar to us as sugar candy. It was well known when the Institutes of Manu were written, but that may have been somewhere between 2000 B.C. and A.D. 20. One of the Hindu Indian deities, Kamadeva, who corresponds to Cupid the god of love, carries a bow made of sugar cane with a string which is composed of bees. Quote, he bends the luscious cane and twists the string. With bees, how sweet, but ah, how keen their sting. He, with five flowerets, tips the ruthless darts, which through five senses pierce enraptured hearts. End quote. From India, it seems to have been carried by Alexander the Great to Asia Minor, for it is mentioned by Herodotus. In the time of the Crusades, it was discovered in Syria, and the Venetians learned something about it when the Crusaders returned to Europe. The Spaniards introduced the sugar cane to the Canary Islands in 1470. Then the Dutch took it to Brazil, and when they were expelled from that country by the Portuguese, they transferred their canes to the West Indian Islands. Our English islands, Barbados, 1643, and Jamaica, 1664, soon found the cultivation a very profitable undertaking. The variations in price of sugar became, in process of time, of a very serious nature. In the year 1329, it is said that in Scotland, a pound of sugar was worth one ounce of standard silver, but from 1780 to 1800, the price fell to nine pence. The East Indian sugar began to compete with that from the West Indies about this time, but this was very soon crushed out by imposing a duty of 37 pounds per hundredweight. The West Indies were then very flourishing, but even before this the fatal word beet sugar had already been heard. It was nothing at first but an interesting experiment by Professor Mark Graff in a German laboratory, who had extracted a little cane sugar from beetroot, in 1747, but in 1801 the beet was already in cultivation. Napoleon saw England's monopoly of the cane and judiciously encouraged the beet. The result of his far-seeing policy only became manifest a few years ago, for then the West Indian islands, which we conquered and guarded against Napoleon at such fearful expense of blood and treasure, were almost worthless. Continental beet sugar had ruined our colonial planters and our home refineries. It is, in fact, a most curious and interesting example of how a little judicious encouragement by a wise and far-seeing government may destroy the profits of victory in a long, glorious, but yet ruinous war. End of chapter 21 Recording by Linda Johnson. Chapter 22 of The Romance of Plant Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Romance of Plant Life. 
by george francis scott elliot chapter twenty two plants and ants meaning of plant life captive and domesticated germs solomon's observations denied by buffon but confirmed by recent writers ants as keepers and germinators of corn ant fields ants growing mushrooms leaf-cutting ants plants which are guarded by insects the african bush ants boarded by acacias and by imbaba trees ants kept in china and italy cockchafer versus ant scale insects a fungus which catches worms the world of plants supports all animal life from the mite to the elephant there are most intricate relations between one form of life and another thus a rose tree attacked by an aphis or green fly may be succored by the slim ichneumon or other thin wasted fly which lays its egg in that of the aphis another insect say a spider catches the ichneumon a starling may eat the spider and be eaten itself by an owl so that ichneumon and starling are friends to the rose whilst the other insect the spider and the owl are enemies yet both the starling and the spider are probably almost certainly on the whole friends of the rose although they are unfriendly in this special case with all other similar series or changes the final term is either a bird or animal of prey or mankind until we introduce the idea of man as the culminating point of the series the whole of it seems to be without any special meaning or advantage but when we think of how man utilizes the work of plants and animals then the whole scheme becomes intelligible and complete it is like a well-rounded story with a worthy and adequate end moreover what man has done so far is only an installment of what he will probably succeed in doing all who have brought up caterpillars or bees know that their greatest difficulty arises from certain minute insects or fungus enemies we already know enough about these latter to fight them with some chance of success but there are hundreds of other spores and germs floating in the atmosphere and coming to rest on animals on clothing or on the leaves or petals of plants these germs are now just as wild as and infinitely more dangerous than the furious aurochs the disdainful wild asses or the ferocious wolves that our forefathers succeeded in domesticating those bacteria or germs for instance which are only one thousandth of a millimeter long are only visible by the help of a microscope a row of three hundred thousand of them would be required to make an inch in length yet one of these germs can be mature and divide into two new germs in twenty minutes in forty minutes there would be four in an hour eight and so on the number after twenty-four hours is almost incredible these little germs stick to our clothes fingers lips money newspapers and anything that is often handled they hover in the air we breathe permeate the food we eat and inhabit water and especially milk in enormous numbers some of them are deadly one might easily decimate a whole population as indeed happened in the south sea islands when smallpox was introduced others are harmless and even necessary but today if you go into a bacteriological laboratory you will find hundreds and thousands of little glass tubes all neatly labeled and stoppered with cotton wool if you read those labels you will see that the bacteria 
of all sorts of horrible and loathsome diseases have been captured and imprisoned there is the deadly anthrax bacillus peacefully discolouring gelatin in another possibly the germs of hydrophobia may be undergoing a process of taming or treatment each of these colonies of germs is under perfect control and in many of them their natural wickedness has been so much alleviated that they are now useful aids to the doctor who gives his patient a mild dose of the disease in order to accustom his system to resist accidental infection by the original type yet what has been done already is only an earnest of what will no doubt be accomplished every farmer and ploughboy will in time sow his own bacteria every dairymaid will make all sorts of cheese from camembert roquefort to gorgonzola by sowing the right kind of germ upon it man will no doubt cultivate the whole earth in the way that he now cultivates europe and great britain and will obtain mastery not only over his domesticated plants and animals but over fungi bacteria and insects also even if man had never risen above the state of the bander log of mr kipling there are other animals which cultivate and even combine together for warfare and conquest in some respects they are better disciplined even than man himself and they can defy all sorts of mankind except civilized man possibly if man had not arisen on the scene these insects might have developed some sort of civilization like that imagined by mr wells in his story of the moon we are only concerned with the relations of these ants to plants those who are interested in their conquests and civilization must consult the excellent account by mr Silas in his romance of the insect world the most interesting points about them are as follows they gather a harvest and store it up for the winter this habit of the ant was well known to the ancients and is mentioned by solomon at the time of the french encyclopedists when the fashion of the times was all for destruction and disbelief the fact that ants do so was ridiculed and flatly contradicted and especially by the great naturalist buffon they pointed out that ants hibernated during the cold weather and therefore required no food for the winter so that solomon's story was absolutely ridiculous for nearly a hundred years people forgot that palestine and those other countries where the habits of ants had been reverently observed possessed a climate much too warm and mild to make the ants hibernate after careful study it has been discovered that the ants thoroughly understand the first stages of brewing the corn which they gather is not eaten by them in its hard winter condition when taken into the winter nest of the ants this corn would very soon germinate and grow into a plant but the ants manage to prevent this by some method which is not yet understood if such a nest is left alone by the ants the corn immediately begins to grow but it is not allowed to do so till it is required for food should the store of corn get damp by heavy rain or mold appear upon it then the careful ants bring up their store into the sunlight and dry it there when it is required for food germination is permitted but is soon stopped the ants nibble off the growing rootlet of the seed then when the grain absorbs water and begins to change its starch into sugar the ants suck in the sugar and reap the reward of all this labor and skill in the conduct of this germination of the grain they are of course far in advance of all the savage races of mankind 
there are certain south american species which go at least one step farther they have their own fields spaces three or four feet in diameter which are entirely occupied by one single grass the so-called ant rice aristida stricta dr lincecum states that the ants work these plantations very carefully removing every weed or other plant that comes up and sowing every year the new seed at the proper season these facts are sufficiently strange and startling but there are even apparently species still more intelligent who not only sow and reap but actually prepare a soil and reap a crop of mushrooms or at least if not of mushrooms of fungi these wonderful little insects gather leaves and cut them into fragments of an appropriate size they are then collected together so as to form a bed and the fungus is introduced to this the fungus is kept at a certain stage of growth by very careful treatment the fruit-bearing ends are nibbled off so that the young shoots come up indefinitely the ants feed upon these fungus shoots and get a crop indefinitely prolonged this is of course a system of agriculture far beyond that employed by any tribe of savages only man in a relatively advanced stage of agriculture grows mushrooms for himself these facts startling as they may seem are apparently quite well authenticated and have not been seriously questioned there are a great number of leaf-cutting ants who are indeed amongst the most dangerous of the many insect pests in south america and elsewhere wallace in speaking of the sauba or leaf-cutters describes how he placed a large heavy branch across the route of one of their columns the long line of laden ants was checked and the greatest confusion set in at the head of the column each ant for several feet down the column then laid down its leaf and all set to work to tunnel under the obstacle this was managed in about half an hour's time and the column then proceeded on its way amongst other interesting and curious facts connected with these extraordinary insects is that some kinds are actually kept up by certain plants as a sort of standing army or police there are no less than three thousand thirty species of plant which keep these standing armies of ferocious ants or if they do not keep them at any rate lay themselves out to attract them the kinds which are attracted live upon sugar and are strong active and extremely good fighters when traveling through the bush of africa it is not unusual in some places to touch inadvertently one of these protected trees in a moment one's hand and arm are covered by ants whose heads are dug deep down into the skin biting with all their strength it is of course impossible to describe all the plants which protect themselves against injurious insects and even large animals in this way but two of them must be mentioned there are certain acacias which are particularly interesting like most of this order they have large hollow spines instead of stipules at the base of the leaf it is inside these spines that the troops of the police insects live these acacias oxhorn acacia as well as a spherocephala and a spedicigera also produce sugar which is secreted by peculiar gland-like organs on the stalks of the leaves and even albuminoids for at the tips of the leaflets there are peculiar little bodies which contain albuminous matter the imbaba tree cecropia species also possesses a standing army of these ants it puts them up in the hollow pith in the center of the tree which is divided into large roomy spaces and makes a convenient nest 
there is a minute opening by which they run in and out on one occasion a naturalist found that the ants had been benumbed by a period of very cold weather and in consequence had neglected their duty and the trees had been stripped of their leaves by leaf-cutting kinds these last mentioned the leaf-cutting ants are especially dreaded by owners of plantations foreign or introduced plants are not specially guarded against their ravages by special secretions as is the case with the native flora so that the coffee and cocoa plantations are often severely injured in some places man has copied those acacias and imbabas for in the orange plantations of the province of canton in china ants nests are collected and placed on the trees moreover the different trees are connected together by bamboos so that the ants can easily pass as on a bridge from one tree to another near mantua in italy the same system seems to be adopted and ants nests are carefully placed near the fruit trees their use can be quite well understood for forel in his work on the ants of switzerland estimates that one ant's nest will require a supply of one hundred thousand insects a day during the season it is quite common to find ants crawling about on the outside of the large heads of the garden century and a few other composites if one looks carefully one finds that there are streaks of honey to be seen coming from the scales the honey is not produced in the flowers and seems at first sight to be of no use at all so far as the plant is concerned but that is very far from being the case here comes a cockchafer or other destructive beetle intent on absolutely devouring and destroying the young flowers at once the pugnacity and wrath of the ants are aroused they take up a menacing and ferocious attitude and the cockchafer passes to some other plant such honey glands found on the leaves and not connected in any way with the flowers are more common than one would think even the common bracken produces curious honey secreting hairs when it is in a young condition these attract ants which drive away caterpillars and other dangerous insect foes many very dangerous insects are too small for birds and can only be dealt with effectually by insects or fungi of these perhaps the most dangerous are the scale insects the best known one is very like a minute mussel shell it is about one quarter to one-third of an inch long and can be sometimes found in quantities on apples they are generally collected round the stalk the mother insect has this scaly back and lies down and dies on the top of her eggs so that her scaly corpse forms a roof and a shield for her young ones like all pests of this sort these creatures increase very rapidly a certain scale insect was doing an immense amount of harm in the orange plantations of fiji but it was destroyed by the introduction of ladybirds and of a certain parasitic fly it is said that these insects destroyed the scale in six months experiments have also been tried with fungi there are certain fungi which attack the bodies of living insects so far however it cannot be said that the results have been at all satisfactory for the propagation and infection of the living insects by fungus spores is not at all easy there is also a certain feeling of doubt as to what may happen those fungi and particularly bacteria might set up dangerous epidemics decaying meal contains hundreds of certain very curious worms called nematodes they are short about one twenty-fifth of an inch in length 
and are smooth and very like minute eels these creatures are very active wriggling or swaying to and fro in a characteristic manner now in decaying meal there is a peculiar fungus like most fungi it consists of very minute transparent threads which contain living matter or protoplasm this particular fungus has branches but also forms curious loops or belts when one of these eel worms is swaying about in the meal it may quite well happen that its tail slips into one of these loops if that happens the fate of the worm is sealed for the loop is elastic and the more it wriggles the further it slips in and the stronger it is held the fungus then begins to grow and forms a tube which grows into the worm and kills it all the material in the worm's body goes to nourish the fungus this extraordinary fungus has been described and figured by professor zopf but seems to be a very unusual and rare form end of chapter twenty two Chapter Twenty Three of The Romance of Plant Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Eliot. Chapter Twenty Three The Peril of Insects. The Phylloxera. French Sport. Life history of the phylloxera, cockchafer grubs, wireworm, the misunderstood crows, dangerous sucklings of green flies, sweat of heaven and saliva of the stars, a parasite of a parasite of a parasite, buds, the apple blossom weevil, apple sucker, the codlin moth in the ripening apple, the pear midge. A careless naturalist and his present of rare eggs, leaf miners, birds without a stain upon their characters, birds and man, motes, dust and mites, the homes of the mites, buds, insect eggs, and parent birds flourishing together. The difficulty in describing the romance of plant life does not arise from a want of romance. But the sieges, battles, and alarms are so difficult to see, and the enemies are so tiny, that the terrific contests continually going on escape our notice altogether. When one does look carefully and closely at the life of a plant, one sometimes wonders how it manages to exist at all in the midst of so many and great dangers. There are great swarms of insects which devour or burrow into it, or suck its life juices. These are infinitely more dangerous than the relatively clumsy, heavy-footed grazing animal. Every part of a plant has its own special insect foe, and it is really difficult to understand how it can possibly escape. Perhaps the Achilles heel is the root, for underground plants get no help from the watchful and ever-present army of birds who are, as we shall see, the natural police of the world. The phylloxera, for instance, which ruined the old and valuable vineyards in France, is a terrible little acarid, or mite, which attacks the roots. Too small to see, and impossible to kill without killing the plant, it laid waste the fertile hills and valleys of all south and central France, causing millions of pounds damage. One reason for this destruction sprang from the universal sporting instinct innate in every Frenchman. Everybody goes out with his gun to destroy any lark, sparrow, or titmouse that is idiotic enough to remain in the country. Only birds can deal efficiently with insect pests. Take this horrible little phylloxera, for instance. A single female in her life of forty-five days will lay about two hundred eggs. Each egg becomes a little grub, which, after a few moments of uncertainty and agitation, settles itself and begins to suck steadily 
at any unoccupied part of the vine root. After ten to twelve days' life, it will be laying eggs as rapidly as its mother. Thus, in an ordinary summer, the number of young ones produced from a single female becomes quite incalculable. These pests are natives of America. Imported on American roots about 1868, they had in 13 years practically ruined the vineyards in France, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and Germany. All sorts of remedies were tried. Saturation of the ground by poisons, flooding the vineyards to drown them, artificial cultivation of their insect and plant enemies, and many others. The correct and satisfactory method has been at last discovered. American vines of sorts which are able to resist these Yankee mites have been imported, and the valuable French vines have been grafted onto them. Another very dangerous root enemy which is common in this country is the cockchafer grub or white grub but it is not nearly so bad as in France, where, in the summer of 1889, a single farmer collected 2,000 pounds of cockchafers. The grub, each female lays 70 eggs, burrows into the earth, and for no less than three summers remains below ground, devouring indiscriminately the roots of everything he can discover. Underground, the mole is almost his only enemy, but the rooks, Starlings and gulls, which follow the plough, are watching for him. The wireworm, click beetle or skipjack, is also an underground demon, which lives for three years and gnaws and worries at plant roots for the whole of that time. It, however, shows itself above the surface. A gentleman who had passed his whole life in the country complained in my presence of the damage done by rooks, he had had 6,000 of them shot that summer, and remarked that he had seen with his own eyes one of them pulling out a young cabbage plant by the root. Of course, it was quite unnecessary to point out that the poor bird was merely trying to get at the wireworms and devour them. For some time I used to look out for great attacks of wireworm in turnip fields. When one was recorded... I never failed to find that the crows had been ruthlessly shot down a season or two before. All these, and many other insects, attack the roots, which would be, one would suppose, quite well protected in the depths of the earth. Therefore we find roots producing all sorts of poisonous substances, tannins, and even strong-smelling bodies which keep off these pests. It is perhaps the sucking battalions of the insect army which do the most harm. In themselves they are weak, stupid, and scarcely move from their birthplace. They live out their life wherever their long, lancet-like proboscis needles have pierced the plant's skin. But it is their power of multiplication that makes them really formidable. Huxley calculated that if all the offspring of one green fly lived, and if their broods also lived for ten generations, then the tenth brood of that original green fly would contain more animal matter than the entire population of China. Green fly would, as a matter of fact, go on increasing at this rate, were it not for the enormous number of enemies that prey upon them. A mathematical friend of Mr. Buckton calculated that, in three hundred days, the produce of a single green fly might be 210 to the 15th power, that is, 210 multiplied by 210, and then again by 210, up to 15 times. In summertime, one may often notice, especially on sycamores and lime trees, a peculiar, shining, sticky, honey-like substance which covers the leaves. It is often so abundant as to drip like a rain of honey from the upper branches. This honeydew was a puzzle which greatly intrigued learned minds in the ancient world. Pliny speaks of it as the sweat of heaven or saliva of the stars. In reality, however, it is nothing but the excretions of hundreds of millions of these green fly or aphids, 
which will be found established on the underside of the leaves, where, moored by their little anchoring talons, and with their proboscis inserted in the fresh green leaf, they are sucking hard and steadily at the sugary juice. In twenty-four hours, it was observed that a single individual gave forth forty-eight minute drops of honey. Bees are often tempted to collect this honey so abundantly produced, but this turns their own honey black and may even make it poisonous. Plants try to protect themselves against these pests chiefly by means of sticky or long hairs, by a thick skin, or by unpleasant tasting or smelling substances. But it is to insects such as ladybirds and others which devour the green fly that they owe a deep debt of gratitude. In particular, there are certain parasitic insects which lay their eggs in their bodies. Not only so, but it is known that the eggs of some other insects are laid in the egg of the green fly, and in one instance it has been found that yet another insect laid its egg in the egg of the parasite. Some of the most interesting objects in nature are the buds, in which, all neatly packed and stowed away, the young leaves and flowers remain awaiting the warm breath of spring. They are most interesting to examine. One finds series after series of overlapping scales, which cover one another in the most ingenious way. No two are exactly alike, but each seems to have been molded exactly to the proper shape. There is no waste anywhere, no useless expenditure of material. Very often turpentine or resin or a sticky gum seals up the joining of the scales. Every possible precaution seems to have been taken by nature. Neither rain nor snow can enter a winter bud. Neither can the cold of winter penetrate to the inside where the baby leaves and flower petals are cosily and tightly coiled up. But observe, in the very earliest warm days of spring, an extraordinary little insect, which has wakened up after its own winter sleep in the moss or lichen covering the rough and crannied bark of an old apple tree. This is the apple blossom weevil, a beetle, only about a quarter of an inch in length, but with a curious snout or proboscis half the length of its body. This creature proceeds to the bud, and, fixing its legs firmly, proceeds to bore a hole through the scales into the middle of the bud. She then places an egg inside, and goes on to put an egg in each of fourteen to forty-nine other buds. This takes a fortnight, and then she dies, probably satisfied that her duty is fully performed. A little footless, cream-white maggot develops in the apple bud, which latter becomes rusty-colored and dies away. Another pest is the apple sucker, which lays her eggs in September on the fine hairs which cover the shoots. As soon as the weather becomes mild and warm, little grubs come out of these eggs, they are very small, and their bodies are almost flat. These tiny flat grubs, as soon as they are born, hurry off to the nearest buds and slip between their scales. They remain sucking the rich juices of the apple blossom until May or June, when they become perfect insects and fly away so fat and well-nourished that they can live until September without feeding but those are by no means the only dangers. It is not till the apple blossom, which has escaped all those perils, opens in the springtime, after its petals have unfolded in the warm air, and the young apple is already half-formed, that the codlin moth begins to attack them. This tiny little moth is then extremely busy. She lays about fifty eggs, but only one on each young apple. It is put in the one weak spot of the apple, just at the top, in the base of the withered flower. The grub tunnels down to the core and feeds upon the seeds, which are entirely destroyed. When it has grown sufficiently, 
it drives another tunnel straight outwards to the skin. If the apple is still on the tree, the caterpillar lets itself down on a long silken thread and hurries off to hide in any convenient crack or crevice of the bark. Or, if the apple is already stored away, it conceals itself in the walls or in the flooring of the loft. The moths come out at the end of next May, just when the blossoms are getting ready for them. These codlin moth apples cannot fail to have been noticed by the reader, as the tunnels in the ripe apple are most conspicuous. The gradual fattening of the caterpillar can also be traced, for its first tunnel down to the seeds is quite narrow, while the way out gets wider and wider as the creature became stouter and fatter whilst eating its way through the flesh. The pear midge attacks at the same place, but the mother insect has a long egg-laying tube and puts from 15 to 30 eggs into the opening pear blossom. The pears go on growing, but of course are quite spoilt by the maggots within. These latter have a curious springing or jumping habit, and when they reach the soil, bury themselves an inch or two below the surface so that all the care and neatness with which the young flowers and buds are packed up goes for nothing, and these insect pests get all the benefits of the apple and pear. Besides these, there are hundreds of sorts of caterpillars which devour the leaves bodily. Cabbage white butterflies, magpie moths, gypsy moths, diamondback moths, and others lay their eggs in hundreds, Many lay 300 eggs each. In the United States, somebody had sent an entomologist a present of some eggs of one of these moths. They were placed on a paper near a window which happened to be open. The entomologist went out, and the paper must have blown across the street into a garden on the other side. At any rate, two or three years afterwards, it was found that some trees were badly attacked by this moth. Nobody thought much about this, though of course it was interesting to find a new moth. But the pest became a very serious one. In consequence of the stimulating air of the United States, the moth multiplied with the most extraordinary rapidity, and it is said that about $300,000 was spent in one year in the attempt to stamp it out. All this happened because an entomologist forgot to lock up his eggs when he went away for half an hour. These caterpillars and the locusts devour the leaves bodily, but there are others which live inside them. These so-called leaf miner caterpillars make white, irregularly winding tunnels between the upper and the lower skin of the leaf. The tunnel increases or widens because the caterpillar itself grows fatter as it eats its tunnel. They can be seen on a great many leaves and can be at once recognized by this peculiarity. Plants cannot run away from their enemies like animals, and it would seem at first sight that their case was very hopeless. But it is not so, for there is a vast, active, keen-eyed and eager army of helpers always ready for eggs and caterpillars. It is birds that are of the greatest importance. A titmouse will eat 200,000 insects in a season. A starling has been seen to fetch food for its young ones from a grass paddock 100 yards away no less than 18 times in a quarter of an hour. All the following are excellent birds, and without a stain upon their characters. The plover, partridge, robin, wagtail, starling. Crows and wood pigeons are under suspicion, for though the latter do good in devouring the seeds of weeds, and the former in destroying wireworms, both are fond of corn and take large quantities of it. Thrushes, Mavises and blackbirds are amongst the most persevering and useful of our friends, but they are certainly fond of fruit. Yet the good which they do is very much more than any possible harm which an injudicious indulgence in the juicy fruits of summer might bring about. 
the sparrow cannot be given a character indeed he is objectionable in every way for he not only does no good himself but he devours corn and drives away starlings and other valuable and interesting helpers but it is very difficult to say what will happen if man interferes with the regular working of nature the starling has been a pest in australia though here it does nothing but good work we are still grossly ignorant of many simple but very important facts even when we do know something as for instance that the peewits or plover's whole life is occupied in clearing the ground of wireworm daddy longlegs grub insects eggs and the like that does not help the bird in the least plover's eggs are regularly sold in enormous quantities every farm laborer collects them and the farmer never dreams of interfering man shoots down owls kestrels hawks who prey upon mice voles and sparrows then when some farmers are half ruined he has royal commissions to find out why the voles have increased so much there are one or two peculiar contrivances found in plants which are intended to keep off insects and which may be noticed here thus the importance of a moat which almost always formed part of the defence of a medieval castle had been already found out by one or two plants in a particular kind of teasel and in a large sunflower like composite sylphium laciniatum every pair of two opposite leaves run together so that a little cup-like hollow is formed surrounding the stem in which water collects insects climbing up the stem and trying to get at the heads of flowers fall in and get drowned in this water their bodies may be seen floating about in it and probably when these decay their decay products are of some use to the plant this curious contrivance is only a development of a very common arrangement in most leaves you will find that rainwater is intended to run in a particular direction there are little grooves and canals down which it is supposed to go and dry thirsty hairs may be found so arranged as to intercept part of it thus in summer the plants are not confined entirely to the water from the ground but are also refreshed by the rain from above but if you look closely along these little channels and especially at the base of the leaf where they join the stem you will find that dust particles washed down by the rain collect and form little streaks and patches the air is full of all sorts of dust particles which are made up of every conceivable substance many of these minute grains of dust will be dissolved in the water and help to supply the plant with food nor is that all for if you take a hand lens and examine these dust particles very closely you will very probably find small animalcula moving about they are not pretty in fact they are quite horrible to look at these are tiny mites which live in these places their office is probably to eat up everything eatable including eggs of insects and spores of fungi and their excreta as well as their own bodies will probably be dissolved in the water and go to help the plants the most certain place to find them is on the leaves of the lime and other trees in august on the underside of the leaf little bushes of hairs can be found just where the veins fork it is necessary to take a pin and stir up these hairs to frighten them out but when this has been done the lens will show the disgusting-looking little creatures running hurriedly away. They are no doubt exceedingly annoyed at being disturbed in the midst of their sleep, for they come out and forage for anything eatable at night, retiring for the day into these hairy grottoes. The structure of these grottoes is very complicated. They are often like little caves with a narrow entrance, and the sleeping chamber is quite within the leaf a great many trees have these curious mite homes the insects are generally the color of the hairs and are not easy to distinguish all those insects mentioned here 
have so arranged their life histories that they come into existence exactly at the proper season. The warmth of the sun, which opens the apple buds ever so slightly, stirs also the egg of the mite, the egg of the beetle, or the hibernating weevil, so that all these insect populations come into full active life just when they can do the most damage. But one must not stop there. The bird population is also ready, and is building its nests and feeding its young, just so soon as the insect swarms are at their thickest and most dangerous stage. Man walks clumsily through this intricate tangle of living plants and animals. He sets his big foot on a hedgehog, good for the insects, or on a mole, so much the better for wireworm, collects plover's eggs, to the great help of every insect, shoots an owl, to the delight of voles and mice, or a whole brood of partridges, and in other ways makes a, we had better say, shows that he is not so clever as he supposes himself to be. End of chapter 23 Recording by Linda Johnson Chapter 24 of The Romance of Plant Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Eliot. Chapter 24 Rubber, Hemp, and Opium. Effects of Opium the poppy plant and its latex, work of the opium gatherer, where the opium poppy is grown, hashish of the Count of Monte Cristo, heckling, scotching, and retting, hemp seed and bang, users of hashish, use of India rubber, why plants produce rubber, with the Indians in Nicaragua, the Congo Free State, Scarcity of Rubber, Columbus and Torquemada, Macintosh, Gutta Percha. Supposing that in China or Japan you meet a native who shows the following symptoms. 1. Eyes hollow and surrounded by a bluish margin. 2. Pupils much dilated. 3. With a stupid appearance. 4. With an emaciated body. 5 of unsteady and staggering walk. 6. With a dreamy disposition, then you may be sure that he is an opium smoker. In some of the Chinese provinces, every man smokes 0 .03 to 0 .07 ounce of opium daily, but those who indulge to excess consume 0 .3 or even 0 .6 ounce. It is an excellent medicine when employed in a lawful and justifiable manner, for it calms the spirits and makes one sleep. But its use is always dangerous, even when employed in very small quantity, as in laudanum and morphia. In the Fen country in England, there used to be a very large sale of laudanum pills, which keep off asthma and rheumatism. But even there, it is a dangerous remedy, for it is only too easy to fall under the control of this drug, either by injection of morphia, or by eating or smoking laudanum or morphia. De Quincey's Confessions of an Opium Eater and Kipling's Gate of the Hundred Sorrows give a lurid picture of the ruin of body and soul brought about by opium. It is produced from the heads of the opium poppy, Papaver somniferum. Any poppy, or indeed any plant of the poppy order, when scratched or wounded, exudes a thick white or orange milky fluid. This is called latex, or milk. It is always more or less poisonous, and generally contains some sort of resinous matter. Thus, when the plant is scratched or pierced, a drop of this milky latex comes out, and at once hardens over the wound. Of course, the plant is much benefited by this, for any destructive insect, unless it is a confirmed opium eater, will be poisoned or killed. 
Then, also, if wounds are caused by wind, heavy rain, or animals passing, the scar is at once healed over and covered by the hardened opium, so that no dangerous fungus spores can get in to attack the plant. There is a mildew fungus and also a smut fungus, entiloma, which attack the poppy, but both these enter by the stomata and live between the cells of the plant. The general appearance of the opium poppy is quite familiar. Its upright stems, large clasping bluish-green leaves, and conspicuous flowers may be seen in many gardens. It is rather interesting, and in many ways. When young, the buds droop or hang down, and are entirely enclosed in two large green hairy sepals. These last are soon thrown off, and then the flowers open out and display the petals with their rich black spots and the crowded mass of stamens which surround the central greenish head. In bud, these petals are crammed up within the impalement by hundreds of little wrinkles or puckers, as if three or four fine cambric handkerchiefs were thrust into one's pocket, as an old writer describes it, grew. Bees, and especially bumbles, are extremely fond of it, and even seem to be, in a way, opium eaters, for they get quite exalted, almost intoxicated, and above their ordinary laborious selves. They scurry round and round the flower under the stamens or hover excitedly above it. It is at this stage that the opium gatherer begins his work. He goes round the beds and collects the petals of the poppy to use later on. The poppy heads are then half-grown and bluish-green, but they soon begin to turn yellow and ripen. When ripe, they are the most interesting to examine. There is a large platform covered by a radiating star-like ornament, which is the stigma. Underneath this is a circle of little holes just below the crown, but above the head. Each small hole has a flap. Now, if you gather a ripe poppy head on a fine dry day, all these holes are open, and if you hold it upright and swing it vigorously from side to side, the tiny seeds come flying out of the holes and will be thrown to a considerable distance. The stalk is supposed to swing in a high wind, and the seeds are really slung or thrown out of the holes. But if, when you come home, you put your poppy head in water, or look at the plants in the garden on a very wet day, you will find that every hole closes or is shut up because the small door mentioned above expands so as to close the opening. The seeds are only sent out on a fine dry day, but they travel well. It was observed in America that certain poppies had been introduced as weeds at a certain place. In 15 years they were found 25 miles farther on, so that they were colonizing the country at the rate of three-fifths of a mile per annum. The seeds themselves are very light and are of some value. They may be eaten like caraway seed, as comfits, or crushed to supply an oil for lamps or used as medicine. It is said that the value of the seed raised in France was in one year 170,000 pounds. The heads themselves are also valuable. They are worth 35 shillings per thousand, and even the dried stalks and leaves, for they may be used as fodder. But the real reason why the plant is cultivated in so many parts of the earth is the great value of the opium obtained from it. This is gathered in the following curious way. As soon as the dew has dried off the plant, the cultivator goes round the beds and scratches every poppy head with a tool made up of three knives tied together. That is the time recommended by Theophrastus, and it is apparently still the usual time to choose. In the late afternoon, from four to seven, he comes round again and scrapes off the congealed milk, which is then worked up into cakes and taken to the factory. It is prepared by being kneaded, dried, and rubbed 
until it is of a pale golden color. Finally, it is enclosed in a mass of poppy petals, sometimes mixed with the fruits of a kind of dock, and is then ready for export. It is cultivated in a great many parts of the world. Turkey, Syria, Persia, France, China, the United States, Germany, Queensland, but especially in British India, where the immense plains at Malwa used to furnish opium worth about 60 million rupees annually, after deducting all expenses. This was mostly exported to China, and amounted to a tax of about threepence per head on every Chinaman. It was also sufficient to defray about one-sixteenth part of the expenses of our Indian empire. The story of how Great Britain forced China to take our opium is not a creditable one, nor agreeable to read. The plant was known in ancient Egypt, Persia, and Rome, and was used in China for at least 200 years before our times. What is supposed to be the original wild plant from which the opium poppy was derived seems to have been cultivated in the ancient Swiss lake dwellings, for the seeds of papaver setigerum occur there in abundance. The price of the crop may amount to 90 pounds or 100 pounds per acre. Another very ancient plant is the hemp, cannabis sativa. It was known to Herodotus, who says that, quote, in the country of the Massagete, there is a tree bearing a strange produce, which they, casting into a fire, inhale its fumes on which they straightway become drunk, end quote. It is a tall, rather handsome annual, with stems from three to fifteen feet high. It is cultivated all over the world, from the equator to sixty degrees north latitude, but for different purposes. In India, it is chiefly for the resin, hashish, churus, bang. That was the drug used by the Count of Monte Cristo. In Russia, it is for the seed and the fiber that the plant is cultivated, and in France, Italy, and Austria, the fiber seems to be the most important product. Some of the plants produce only stamens, or male flowers. The fiber given by these is stronger and more tenacious than that of the female plant, which, however, is finer and more supple. The fiber obtained from the cold northern districts of Russia is said to be the strongest of all. The preparation of the fiber is a long, tedious, and laborious operation. It is also unhealthy, for the fiber has to be retted, steeped in water so that the soft parts decay. Scotched, that is, the hardwood must be broken and removed, and heckled. This last process is familiar to all who are interested in political matters. It consists of being drawn on hard points difficult to traverse, and of a very fine and sharp character. Hemp is the commonest fiber for string, rope, etc. It used to be employed for sail-making by the Romans. Catherine de' Medici is said to have had two chemises made of hemp. Hemp seed is much appreciated by poultry and birds of all kinds, which makes both harvesting and sowing rather difficult. But the chief use of the seed is to furnish a fatty oil used for soft soap, lighting, and painting. The remains, after taking the oil, are employed as a cattle food but it does not form a satisfactory cake. The chief interest of hemp is, however, the drug that is made from the resinous juice. No doubt, this has the effect of keeping off dangerous insects, for it is said that plants of hemp even keep off insects from other plants planted close beside them. Sometimes the leaves and stalks are dried in order to make the drug bang, Many allusions to this substance are found in Eastern poetry, where it is called the leaf of delusion, increaser of pleasure, and cementer of friendship. But madness is the result of addiction to its use. The resin is collected by making the laborers put on leather aprons 
and then run up and down vigorously through the hemp fields. The resin is then scraped off the leather, or off their skins if they prefer to do without the leather. It is either eaten or smoked. Burton describes how at every cottage door in East Africa the Arabs may be seen smoking bang, with or without tobacco. Quote, it produces a violent cough, ending in a kind of scream after a few long puffs. End quote. In small doses, hashish resin has pleasant effects, for people experience pleasant illusions, good appetite, excitement, and laughter, followed, however, after an interval by stupor and sleep. People addicted to the use of hashish roll their eyes violently and have a wild, startled appearance. Naturally, so dangerous a drug cannot be recommended unless under the most exceptional circumstances, but it is employed in cases of asthma and insomnia. Hashish and opium are the two great curses of the Chinese, Malays, and the inhabitants of British India and the East. They may be compared to drink in this country, but they are important medicines. Among the most curious and interesting facts in nature is the extraordinary variety of the ways in which, at present, gutta percha and India rubber are employed. We should not be able to ride bicycles or in motor cars. We could not use Atlantic cables and many electrical apparatus. Our railway carriages would be most uncomfortable. Golf would be impossible. We should have no waterproof coats and no galoshes if it were not for these valuable and extraordinary substances, India rubber, or caoutchouc, and gutta percha. Their history is full of romance, but perhaps the most striking part of it is just this fact. Because a few, only a very few, plants found it necessary to protect their wood from burrowing beetles by a specially poisonous and elastic substance, therefore we can play golf and enjoy freewheel bicycles. The rubber is derived from the resinous latex or milky juice which pours out from any wound in the bark of certain trees and creeping plants. This milk must be poisonous enough to kill the rash and intrusive mother beetle who wishes to lay her eggs in the wood. It must be elastic, because the branches and stems swaying to and fro in the wind require a yielding, springy substance, but resin is contained in it, so that it promptly hardens and closes up the scar. The traveler Belt, in his Naturalist in Nicaragua, mentions that those trees which had been entirely drained of their rubber by the Indian gatherers were riddled by beetles and in an unhealthy, dying condition. Almost all the important rubber plants are found in wet, unhealthy tropical forests. They are by far the most important jungle product in West Africa, as well as on the Congo River and in the Amazon Valley. It is quite impossible to describe the various rubber trees and the different methods of gathering rubber, but it may be interesting to quote from an account of the method of its collection in Nicaragua by Mr. Roland W. Cater. The best season for tapping the trees of Castilloa elastica is from August to February. It is best also to perform the operation early in the morning before the daily rain, quote, or in the evening after the rain has fallen. The milk is white and of the consistency of cream. The tree thrives best in moist but not marshy forests. It seeds in the tenth year and ought not to be tapped before its eighth year or its growth may be much retarded. On reaching the group of trees, which numbered seventeen of various sizes, my Carib friends first cut away the twining creepers that almost hid the trunks, and then carefully removed a couple of buruchas, natural ropes of rubber, formed in the following manner. From incisions in the bark, possibly caused by woodpeckers or some insect, the juice often exudes, 
trickling down the trunk, in and out of the encircling creepers, and sometimes reaching the ground. The milky stream coagulates and turns black as it runs, forming a long strip or cord with which the juleros often tie up their bales. The parasites removed, Peter and Jose strapped on their espuelas, climbing spurs, fastened at the knee and ankle, and, having dug a small pit or basin at the foot of each of a couple of trees, passed a ring of stout rope round the trunks and their own waists, and walked up with their machetes between their teeth. By lifting the rope at every step, they were enabled to stand almost erect, and when lying back in the ring, both hands were at liberty. Jose, whom I watched closely, commenced operations immediately below the first branch. With his broad-bladed sword, he cut in the bark a horizontal canal, which almost encircled the trunk and terminated in a V-shaped angle. From the point of the V downwards, he next cut a perpendicular canal about two feet in length, which joined another horizontal channel, ending in a V, and so on to the ground. In the last cut, he inserted a large green leaf to serve as a funnel and guide the milk into the basin. The Brazilian rubber collectors always place a receptacle of tin or earthenware in the hole at the foot of the tree to prevent the admixture of grit or other foreign matters. They also strain the milk through coarse muslin, hence the greater value of para rubber. But Nicaraguan methods are primitive. End quote. In the Congo Free State, the taxes are paid by the collection of rubber. It is alleged that, quote, if the demands for rubber or other produce were not satisfied, the people at fault were flogged often most barbarously with a thong of twisted hippopotamus hide called the chicota, or else the natives were told to catch the women from the offending villages who were brought to the chef de poste and imprisoned by him as hostages for the industry of their husbands or else the sentries shot some of the defaulters as examples to the rest. Frequently, there were armed expeditions into refractory districts and widespread promiscuous slaughter. The cannibal soldiers of the state or of the company sometimes feasting on the bodies of the slain. End quote. The supply of rubber has of recent years shown signs of becoming exhausted, as time goes on, the Indians of the Amazon and Orinoco must every year travel deeper into the inaccessible forests of the Amazon, Orinoco, or in Nicaragua. Every year also makes it more difficult for the Malagasy in Madagascar or the Negroes in West Africa and the Congo to gather sufficient rubber for the world's ever-growing needs. Liberia, the Negro Republic, is said still to possess plenty of rubber, but it is probable that the true solution of the difficulty will be found in the plantation of rubber trees. The exports from Madagascar in 1903 were valued at 2,585,000 francs, from Brazil, 9,700,000 pounds, from Nicaragua, 400,000 gold pesos, 12 pesos to the pound, from the Congo, 47 million francs, but even then, about 85,000 rupees worth of rubber was exported from plantations in Ceylon. Unfortunately, the trees do not begin to yield until they are eight years old, but the estimated profit per acre is very high, at least according to some authorities, who give a yield of 88 pounds per acre in Nicaragua. One cannot help hoping that this will be the case. When one thinks, example, of the Uachins in the forests at the head of Namkong, who spent 40 days in carrying their rubber on men's shoulders across the mountains to Assam, or of the horrible stories of the Congo Free State, plantation seems decidedly a more satisfactory method of supplying us with golf balls and bicycle tires. The first account of India rubber is found in Herrera, Columbus's second voyage, 
who describes the way in which the natives play quote, with great dexterity and nimbleness they struck balls with any part of their bodies End quote. juan de torquemada in sixteen fifteen gives quite a good description of the castilloa rubber quote, the tree is held in great estimation and grows in a hot country it is not a very high tree the leaves are round and of an ashy color it yields a white milky substance thick and gummy and in great abundance it is wounded with axe or cutlass and from the wound the liquid drops into calabashes indians who have got no calabashes smear their bodies over with it for nature is never without a resource and when it becomes dry remove the whole incrustation end quote the first patent for waterproofing seems to have been granted in 1791. A Charles Mackintosh invented the garment named after him in 1823. Very little of the commercial rubber is obtained from the common India rubber fig, Ficus elasticus, which we commonly grow indoors. This is one of those species of the fig family which are generally found growing on the branches or trunks of other trees, though their own roots crawl down the trunk of the support to the ground. Once these roots have reached the ground, they take firm hold and grow so large and thick that they may be able to hold up the fig tree even if the original support decays and crumbles away. The gutta percha which we use comes chiefly from Singapore, which is a sort of world's market for rubber. There are a great many different varieties and substitutes of this substance, but the best kinds come from Malaysia, Singapore, Sumatra, Java, and Borneo. The uses of gutta percha and of vulcanite, which is manufactured from it, are very varied. Thus, it is employed for the soles of boots, door handles, pipes, ear trumpets, buckets, submarine cables, etc., it is indestructible in seawater and does not conduct electricity. A very extraordinary exception to the general rule that latex is highly poisonous is found in the famous cow tree of Venezuela. This tall tree, it is often 100 feet high, is found in large forests near Cariaco on the coast of that country. Its milk is said to closely resemble ordinary milk in taste and to be perfectly wholesome and nutritious, but it is rather sticky. This tree was responsible for all sorts of curious and extraordinary legends in the 16th and 17th centuries. End of chapter 24. Recording by Linda Johnson. Chapter 25 of The Romance of Plant Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Elliott Chapter 25 On Climbing Plants Robin Run the Hedge Bramble Bushes Climbing Roses Spiny, Wiry Stems of Smilax The Weak Young Stem of a Liane the way in which stems revolve, the hop and its little harpoons, a climbing palm, rapidity of turners, the effect of American life on them, living bridges, rope bridges in India, the common stitchwort, tendrils, their behavior when stroked or tickled, their sensibility, their grasping power, the quickness with which they curve and their sense of weight, Charles Darwin, reasonableness of plants, Corkscrew spirals, the pad of the Virginian creeper, the ivy, does it do harm? Embracing roots, tree ivy. There are many plants which depend upon and cling to other more sturdy kinds, and which would be quite unable to live upon the earth at all if they had not developed the most beautiful methods of doing so. In autumn, as soon as the leaves of the hawthorn have fallen off, one is sure to find upon the hedges the common robin run the hedge, goosegrass, cleavers, or sticky willy, for it is known by all these nicknames, as well as by its proper name, gallium aperine. 
Its stem is exceedingly weak, but it will be found sometimes to be six or seven feet long. It does not support itself, but is resting amongst and entangled in the outer twigs of the hedge, in such a manner that it cannot be blown away by the wind, or indeed picked out without its being broken. The young stems grow upright, and are vigorous at first, but soon they cannot bear their own weight, and fall back upon a branch of the hedge. There are small curved little roughnesses along the stem, and on the underside of the leaves of the gallium. These hitch on to the twig. Up to this point, then, the stem is supported, and the young part above grows until it also gets a lodgment, and so it goes on until it sometimes reaches right over the top of the hedge. Its young flowering branches grow out towards the light, away from the main stem, and the yellow withered stem in autumn rests upon the hedge just as a piece of string laid upon it might do. The bramble and rose manage to get a support in very much the same way but in Great Britain the bramble generally grows in open ground, and its branches take root. The peculiar curved back prickles of the bramble and its arching sideways growth would of course hang it on to any horizontal branches in the neighborhood. Kerner measured the length of the stem of a bramble which had interwoven itself into the boughs of a tree, and found that it was over twenty feet long, although it was only one-third of an inch thick. In Chile, one often finds hedges of brambles 10 to 15 feet in height, which have been formed by the aid of other plants, and also by the way in which the branches become entangled with one another. Some climbing roses act in a very similar way, especially if grown on trellis, but the flower shoots always turn to the light like those of the gallium. But it is the creepers and lianes of the tropical forest that are the most remarkable of all climbing plants. They twine round the stems and hang in great loops and grotesque folds from the branches. Sometimes in the dense shade it may be difficult to see the main stem, for it is quite thin, though as strong as a piece of steel wire. It often happens, when hurrying through a rather open part of the forest after game, that one's leg suddenly catches in a thin, spiny, wiry stem of smilax or some such creeper. The first that one knows of the creeper is when a quarter of an inch of the spine is buried in one's flesh. Away up amongst the branches and foliage, far above one's head, leaves and flowers are developed on numerous branches which have vigorously pushed out as soon as they got near the sunlight, this tough, spiny, thread-like stem being their only connection with the ground. The development of these climbing plants is probably connected with the dense shade of forests. In such places, a young stem growing up will become long and drawn out. Its tip will droop over and hang downwards but there is a curious peculiarity in the growth of all stems. The stem generally grows more rapidly at any one time on one side, say on the north, and therefore bends over to the opposite side. After a time it will be growing most rapidly on the eastern side, and then its head points westwards, and so on. The result is that the tip of the stem swings in an irregular circle around the stem itself. Its head turns to every point of the compass in succession. Supposing a stone is tied to the end of a piece of string, and one swings the stone horizontally in a circle. Then, if an upright stick is put in the ground and the string comes against it, the string will coil itself round the stick because the stone goes on swinging horizontally. Our young climbing plant in the shade of the forest acts in exactly the same way. If there is any trunk of a suitable size, it will, in the course of its revolving or sweeping round, first touch, and then coil itself round and round the trunk. Of these twining stems, one of the most interesting and beautiful is the common hop. The young shoots or suckers which come from the ground may be seen waving their stems helplessly round in the air. If they cannot find something to cling to, then they form weak, limp curves. But if one such shoot touches a pole, it very soon obtains a hold, wraps itself round the support, and easily climbs up to a height of many feet. But the hop is worth examining closely. If one passes the fingers along the stem, it feels rough and prickly. With the aid of a hand lens, a whole series of the most exquisite little hooks will be discovered. They are like small pimples with two or three very fine and minute sharp grappling hooks on the top. These prevent the stem from slipping off. It is also helped in climbing by its leaves, which curve outwards, and are also provided with grappling prickles on the underside. At the top of the stem, the young leaves are close together and folded near the point, so as not to interfere with the tip finding its way in and out of a trellis work or amongst branches. These grappling hooks on the hop are as perfect in their way, 
though by no means so beautiful and elegant as those which are found in the climbing palm, Desmoncus, so well described by Kerner in his Natural History of Plants. It is one of the rotang palms, which reach lengths of 600 feet, though their stem may be no more than one and one-third to two inches thick. The leaflets towards the end of the leaf are transformed into strong, spiny barbs which are exquisitely adapted to hang on to other plants. In many places, thickets in which these rotang palms have developed are so matted and tangled together that it is quite impossible even to cut into them, and they are practically impenetrable. Some of our common British twiners climb very quickly. A complete turn round the supporting pole was made in England at Charles Darwin's home in the following times. The hop took two hours and eight minutes, wisteria two hours and five minutes, convolvulus one hour and forty-two minutes, and phaseolus one hour and fifty-four minutes. A honeysuckle took seven hours and thirty minutes to make one complete turn round the support. Recently, Miss Elizabeth Simons timed the rate of growth of the same plants at the University of Pennsylvania. They seem to have been stimulated by the exhilarating atmosphere of the United States, for they were all growing faster. The hop did its turn in one hour and five minutes. Phaseolus took from one hour to one hour and twenty minutes. Convolvulus, fifty-seven minutes only. Lonicera, from one hour forty-three minutes to two hours and forty-eight minutes, and Wisteria, two hours but there are curious variations in the rate at which these plants revolve. Thus, when coming towards the light, they go as fast as they can, but revolve more slowly, and as it were, reluctantly, away from it. It has been found in one case that the shoot took 35 minutes to do the semicircle towards the light, and an hour and 15 to 20 minutes going away from it. But this is not always the case, for sometimes the reverse takes place. These twining plants are not very common in Great Britain, and indeed in Europe. Some of them move or twine to the right, in the same direction as the hands of a watch or of the sun, such as the convolvulus, bindweed, phaseolus, ipomea, and aristolochia. Others, like the hop, polygonum, convolvulus, honeysuckle, and elephant's foot, move in the opposite way from right to left, or wittershins. But there is nothing very important in this distinction, for the bittersweet may be found twining in either direction, and in some plants part of a stem may be twining one way and the other in the opposite direction. It is in the tropics, and especially in the rank, dark, moisture-laden atmosphere of the coast jungle forests, that these twiners attain their greatest development. They show the most extraordinary variety. Sometimes a twiner hangs in elegant festoons from branch to branch, forming a convenient suspension bridge for monkeys. Sometimes four or five are wound round one another or twisted together, so that they look like some gigantic cable. In other cases, they are knotted, looped, tangled, and twisted in the most inextricable manner. Some creepers are flat, like green ribbons or broad bands. In others, the dense mass of old, thick creepers and twiners round some sturdy trunk becomes so thick and so fused together that when the trunk dies, the lattice-like arrangement of these creepers may keep them upright, although the original supporting trunk is quite rotten and decayed away. More usually, a tree will become unhealthy because its branches are overladen with the dense foliage and flowers of heavy lianes, and because both trunk and branches are so strangled in the embrace of great creepers that they cannot expand and develop in the proper way. Then a storm will overthrow the dead giant of the forest, and these creepers, entangled with all the surrounding trees, will produce ruin and destruction all round. A regular duty of the foresters in India is to cut the stems of climbing plants. These twining, trailing, rope-like creepers are in fact natural ropes and are used as such in India, Burma, and other places. Sometimes they form natural bridges of living plants extending across a stream. The great suspension bridges in the valleys of the Himalayas are sometimes made without a single nail or plank. They are just three ropes, one for the feet and two to hold on by, made of jungle creepers. Crossing one of these swinging, swaying creeper bridges is not an easy matter for those whose heads are unaccustomed to depths of hundreds of feet below them, especially if combined with a motion of the creeper bridge sufficient in itself to produce violent seasickness. Yet the natives run across them with loads on their heads. But it is not necessary to go to the tropics to find interesting and ingenious climbing plants. There is a very common little British plant, Stellaria holostia, 
the star of Bethlehem, great starwort or stitchwort, which is common in shady places, light woods, and by hedges. In the spring it grows very quickly, and the pairs of leaves are shut together over the growing point so that the end of the stem is narrow and can insert itself between the leaves and twigs of the neighboring plants. As soon as such a growing end gets out of the foliage into the light, each pair of leaves opens out and curves backwards, excellently suited to hang the stem onto the leaves or twigs. Then another period of growth follows, and again a new pair of hook-like leaves opens out. The stem may be five or six feet long. In a rather rare speedwell, Veronica scutellata, a very similar method is used, but the leaves have special little backward-pointing teeth on their edges, which assist in the attachment process. But these leaves are not to be compared, as regards perfection of mechanism, with the tendrils by means of which plants climb. These tendrils are thin, flexible, twining threads, which may be formed by the modification of whole leaves, in other cases of leaflets, or sometimes of branches. Sweet peas, vetches, passion flowers, vines, and many other plants possess them. They are like twining plants in the way in which they revolve or twine, so as to wrap themselves round anything which they touch. They move much faster than twining plants. A cobea tendril only takes 25 minutes to make a complete turn. Passion flowers take from half to three quarters of an hour and the vine tendril takes a little over an hour to make one complete turn. But in one way they differ altogether, for they are sensitive to contact. If tickled, they contract and embrace closely the object which is touching them. They show a most extraordinary sensibility and sensitiveness. As a matter of fact, these tendrils have a finer sense of touch and a much more delicate feeling of weight than any human being. They detect the weight of 27 inches of a spider's thread. It is, however, best to explain what happens. A half-grown curved tendril of the passion flower is perhaps the most interesting to experiment with, but any sort of tendril does quite well. If one very gently rubs the inner or concave side of its little hook, then in a very few minutes or even seconds the tendril distinctly curves. If this has happened naturally, as when, for instance, it has been rubbing upon a pea stick, this curve makes it curl round the stick, and the more it touches, the more it curls, until the whole tendril is wrapped around the support. It is, of course, quite impossible to explain it all exactly. The sensitive part on the inside of the curve differs from the outside or convex part of the tendril. The former has a layer of elongated, thin-walled cells full of the living matter, protoplasm, which are absent on the outer side. Immediately the tendril touches the stick, the outer convex surface begins to grow rapidly, it grows from 40 to 200 times as fast as the inner side which touches the stick. Very soon after it has clasped the stick, the tendril becomes woody and forms a strong woody spiral coil. These tendrils can be made to curve by a weight exceedingly small. The most sensitive part of our own skins is quite unable to distinguish so small a weight as is perceived by these tendrils. Even the sensation of taste can only be produced by a weight eight times as great as that shown by some of them. Tendrils curve very quickly after they have been touched. In 20 seconds, some tendrils curve cyclanthera, others, passiflora, take 30 seconds, and some of them require four to five minutes or even longer before they make up their minds to coil. Even more remarkable, however, is the fact that they do not coil when raindrops fall on them, giving a much harder blow than small weights. If one tendril touches or rubs against another, it is said not to curve. They are persevering little things also, for Darwin got a passion flower tendril to curve when struck or rubbed no less than 21 times during 54 hours. If one reflects on all these curious facts, it is difficult to help feeling that these plants behave very much in the way that a reasonable animal would do. There are many other cases in which some vegetable does exactly what we should expect of reasonable beings under the circumstances. The tip of the root, the sensitive plant, the monkey and barberry flowers are all well-known cases. So that it is difficult to find anything in science to contradict the comfortable belief that wide-open flowers and stretched-out leaves of plants, as they drink in the warm rays of the sunlight, are really enjoying themselves whilst they are doing their day's work. All these interesting facts are so beautifully described and so carefully summed up by Charles Darwin 
that we shall only earnestly recommend our readers to get first that fascinating book, The Power of Movement in Plants, and then read all the rest of his works. There are an extraordinary number of these plants, and the tendrils are formed exactly where they will be most useful. Every part of a leaf may become a tendril. The whole leaf is changed into one in some kinds of lathyrus. In a very beautiful creeper, which is not so often grown in greenhouses as it might be, Gloriosa superba, the tip of the leaf only acts as a tendril. Leaflets are often made into tendrils. The clematis is the most economical of them all for the leaf stalk coils round and forms little woody rings which hold up the plant. Before leaving the subject of tendrils, it may be interesting to notice the queer corkscrew spirals in which they roll themselves up. These spirals are formed after the end of the tendril has tied itself to the support and become woody. The free part between the end and its own stem goes on revolving. Now if you tie a piece of string at both ends and make it revolve, you will see at once that it must coil itself into a double spiral, one part in one direction and the other in the opposite way, with a flat piece between them. One might be disposed to think no more about these double coils, but here comes in one of the curious, inexplicable coincidences which happen so often in plant life. Such a coil is much stronger than a straight bit of wire or string would be, because if pulled out it yields and is springy. That, of course, makes it less probable that the tendril will be broken. Attached by a series of wiry springs, the plant yields and sways to the wind and is not likely that it will be torn away. Besides this, the coiling of the tendril pulls the stem closer to its support, which is also a great advantage. Certain Virginian creepers and vines behave in quite a different manner. The tendrils grow away from the light, and so seek the shadow of the leaves. They are also divided into little branches. At the tip of each little branch is a small knob. If this should touch the wall or the trunk of a tree, etc., it immediately secretes a drop of cement and glues itself firmly to the wall. There is a curious difference in different sorts of ampelopsis in this respect. There is no adhesive pad in one of them, ampelopsis heteracea, until it touches, whilst A. vecchi has them more or less ready for gluing before they touch, though they become much larger and better developed as soon as they rub against the wall. One of the most interesting of our common climbers, that rare old plant, the ivy green, has not yet been mentioned. It is exceedingly decorative on walls, especially on ruins and on old tree trunks in winter time, where its dark, brilliant green is most effective. A violent controversy rages as to whether it does good or harm. Unhappily, it does not do any good to trees. It does not suck their sap, for its roots do not get through the bark, but it does choke with its clinging branches young tree stems and prevents their growing properly. Also, in winter storms, an ivy-covered tree is much more likely to be blown down. But on walls, the ivy certainly does good, for it sucks up the moisture, and ivy-covered walls are much more dry inside than those which are exposed to rain. Its method of climbing is very curious. All along the stem, quantities of little roots are produced. They dislike light, like most roots, and creep into crevices and cracks where they wedge themselves in by growing thicker. Thus, the stem is anchored all along its length. It is curious to find that these roots are formed before a twig is actually touching the wall so as to be ready for any emergencies. One interesting little point in the growth of the ivy on a tree is perhaps worth mentioning. The main stem runs nearly straight up the trunk, and when young is pulled down into the crevices or cracks in the bark. But its branches leave the main stem at an angle of 45 degrees or so to it. These latter may often grow in this direction for a foot or 18 inches, but then they gradually begin to turn more and more distinctly up the tree. Still, these branches firmly clasp the trunk like arms spread out on either side of it and make it almost impossible to dislodge the main stem. Old plants of ivy entirely surround the trunk. The flowering branches grow straight out into the air and have no tendency to cling to the bark. Their leaves are also different. The ivy may be considered as a root climber, although the branches assist by growing round the stem. A curious instance has been given me of the longevity of ivy and its power of clinging to life. A correspondent mentions the case of a Scotch fir, whose life was threatened by an ivy. The trunk of the ivy was sawn through. That did not kill it, at any rate immediately. 
Probably the rain soaked up by the leaves and by the roots in the crevices of the bark kept it sufficiently fresh to cling to life. As it refused to die, a ladder was brought and it was dragged off the tree. No doubt it would have died if the weather had been at all dry. There are some very beautiful tropical plants which also climb by means of their roots. These roots, the so-called girdle roots, grow right round the stem and embrace it, so that the climber is perfectly supported. It is impossible not to be impressed with the extraordinary variety of all these contrivances by which plants are able to escape the trouble of supporting themselves. But such ways of life involve certain disadvantages. Supposing there is nothing on which to climb, the stems trail feebly on the ground and are probably soon choked by the surrounding grasses. Curiously enough, there are varieties of the ivy, wisteria, and the French bean which are upright and do not climb at all. The tree ivy has all its leaves like the leaves of the flowering shoot in the common form. In America, Wistaria sinensis is often grown as a standard tree, and does not send out the long shoots, sometimes 30 feet in length, which are common when it grows on walls. The dwarf French bean has a thick stem and requires no support, yet it often puts out a long slender shoot which tries to twine round something. In a tropical forest also, the creepers, though they damage the trees, yet manage to find space for their leaves and flowers. More vegetable matter is formed per square yard of ground than would be the case if there were no climbing plants. End of chapter 25. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 26 of The Romance of Plant Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Stays. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Elliot. Chapter 26 Plants Which Prey on Plants. The Kinds of Cannibals. Bacteria. Spring Flowers pale ghostly wood flowers their alliance with fungi gooseberries growing on trees orchid hunting the life of an orchid the mistletoe balder the beautiful druids mistletoe as a remedy its parasitic root the tree it prefers the cactus loranthus yellow rattle and eye bright or milk thief and their root suckers broom rape and toothwort their color and taste the scales of the toothwort which catch in immacula sir samford raffles a flower yard across the daughter its twining stem and sucker roots parasites rare degenerate and dangerously situated the word cannibal is often used in a very loose and unscientific way Amongst some savage tribes, it is the custom to eat old people and young children, but this is only in seasons of famine and scarcity, when there is no other food available, and not because they are especially fond of them. But amongst other tribes, wars are made for the special purpose of capturing fat young people to cook. Sometimes they have become so accustomed to such delicacies that they are unable to get their food in any other way. Of course, when tribes become pure cannibals of this last type, they have to be destroyed like wild beasts. Amongst plants, we find all sorts of transitions in degrees of cannibalism. There are plants which sometimes, and, as it were, accidentally attack others. But there is also real cannibal plants which live entirely on the life juices and sap of other plants, and cannot exist by their own labors at all. Moreover, we can find almost every conceivable state of transition. These can be clearly and definely traced from those plants which depend on the labor of their own roots and leaves to others, which have no leaves, which merely consist of one large flower and a large adhesive sucker fixed on someone else's roots. The difficulty is often to know where to draw the line. Probably no flowering plant is quite independent of labor and work of its neighbors. As we have tried to show in another chapter, a long preliminary cultivation by bacteria, lichens, and mosses is required before flowering plants can develop on bare rock. That is so also necessary in all cases where soil is mineral or inorganic, without any organic dust or fragments of vegetables or animal matter. 
Bacteria must always begin the work by preparing nitrates and other salts, so that only those bacteria which weather rocks can be called really free and independent. But other bacteria, such as those which cause typhoid, anthrax, hydrophobia, etc., are best possible examples of pure cannibals, or, as they are usually described, parasites. This last word is derived from a peculiar class of people in ancient classical times, who used to appear whenever a meal was going to begin and receive foods without giving anything in return. They are represented by our tramps or by the sundowners in Australia, who appear as soon as the evening meal is ready, and when there is no possibility of going any further on their journey. The way in which plants became parasites or cannibal is a very interesting part of plant life, and we shall try to trace some of the various stages. To begin with, if one looks out for them in spring, one is sure to find a whole series of beautiful spring flowers. There is the primrose with its bright, hardy yellow flowers, the violet whose strong perfume much annoys the huntsman for it spoils the scent and shows him that the end of winter has come, the delicate little moschatel, the lesser celandine, the bluebell or hyacinth, dog's mercury, the male and the lady fern, and many others. Most of these begin to grow and are in flower early in the season. That is because they are living on the dead leaves of last year, or rather of two or three years ago. The roots are breaking up and devouring with the helps of worms, beetles, and insects, the leaf mold of past seasons. They are quite dependent on the trees. They cannot exist except where such leaf mold is formed. But it is difficult to tell whether these humble little herbs which live on the scraps that fall from the tall trees are either parasites or clients, which last do some good in return for their share. Probably they are distinctly useful and good for the forest if this is considered as a whole establishment. They use light which would otherwise be wasted, and their own dead leaves increase the annual deposit of leaf mold. There are other plants such as the bird's nest, neotia, and coral root orchids, as well as monotropa and others, which also live on the rich, decaying leaf mold of the forest. But these are generally pale in color, for they possess but little green chlorophyll. Footnote. In the first, the entangled under stems and roots resemble a bird's nest. In the second, the peculiar red rhizomes are rather like coral. End footnote. They are more directly dependent on the mold and have ceased to do much work for themselves. Most of them, in fact, have entered into an alliance with the fungi and use these fungi to get their food material from the dead leaves. Such fungi are always abundant in good, well-grown forests. See page 86. These orchids and monotropa have their roots and underground stems covered and wrapped around by the fungi threads, which extend from them in every direction, breaking up and decomposing the dead leaves. The color of the monotropa is a pale waxing yellow. That of the others is usually a ghostly pale opalescence, steel blue or coral-like hue, which makes them very distinct in the dim, mysterious shades of the forest. These plants are undoubtedly of use, for they break up and decompose the leaf mold. Another very interesting group are not well represented in this country. Sometimes one may see on an old tree a gooseberry bush in full foliage quite high up the trunk in the fork of the branches. In sheltered woody ravines, polypody ferns are often established on an old moss-clad branches, where their green fronds hang over to catch as much as they can of the sunlight. But orchids, bromelades, and ferns, which grow upon branches of great trees, are one of the most conspicuous and beautiful features of tropical woods. It is for these tree orchids that the orchid hunters braves the head hunters of Borneo or traverses the precipices and rugged forests of Guatemala and Brazil. It is often necessary to cut down a tall tree in order to get the orchids in its higher branches. Often, however, this is unnecessary, for the tree is so held up by creepers and other giants of the forest that it never reaches the ground. Then, after being stripped from the branches in some out-of-the-way forest class range of Burma, Salabese, South America, or Madagascar, these orchids are dried up, put in crates, and packed off to London, where they are carefully cultivated in hot houses and persuaded to flower. They may be worth six pence, or they may be worth five hundred pounds each, but no one can tell until they have flowered in London. 
but the romance of the orchid hunter is not exactly what we have to describe here it is rather the romance of life of the orchid itself it is perched high up on the branches of the tallest trees in the forest exposed to sun exposed to wind and quite unable to gather either salts or rain from the soil how then does it manage to live these orchids it must be remembered are only found in out-of-the-way and feverish unhealthy places where their aboriginal savages still lurk and endure a dreadful existence of hunger and starvation in dense tropical forests now the word dense explains the whole story those forests are so thick so full of giant trees and exuberant growth that civilized man even today in nineteen o six can make nothing of them and leaves them to the savage the reason why vegetation is so luxuriant is simply that there is both plentiful moisture and a hot tropical sun that makes the life of the orchid possible and also endures malaria for the hunter it hangs out into the moist air long pendulous roots which act as so many sponges absorbing and soaking in moisture the tremendous energy of growth covers bark and branches with creeping plants innumerable with a profusion of moss liverworts and ferns such as we cannot imagine from our own experiences in this country so the roots of our orchid finds on the branches rich leaf mold and it lives happily and contentedly on the salts and moistures accumulated by the mosses and other plants its leaves are fleshy and succulent rather like those of a desert plant so that it can store up water against a season of drought these plants which grow in this way on other plants do not as a rule greatly injure them but many have not stopped at this stage take for instance the gooseberry growing in the fork of an old tree some bird has been eating gooseberries and dropped the seeds there the root of the gooseberry will grow down into the rotten part of the trunk earth and leaf mold will accumulate there and it is quite probable that the whole inside of the tree will decay away the roots of the gooseberry will if only indirectly help in this decay but it is far otherwise with another set of plants the mistletoe and its allies there is plenty of romance connected with the mistletoe dr m t masters says the following the origin of the modern custom connected with mistletoe is not very clear like many other customs its original significance is only guessed at if known perhaps the innocent merriment now associated with the plant would be exchanged for a feeling of stern disapproval and the mistletoe would be banished from our homes in such case ignorance is bliss it will be remembered that all the gods of iceland were once gathered together so that a general oath might be exacted from every plant that grew upon the earth that they would do no harm to balder the beautiful the mistletoe did not take the oath because it does not grow upon the earth but upon a tree then the enemy fashioned an arrow out of mistletoe and killed balder there is a modern idea that the story is a myth representing the death of spring for a great many similar stories occur in widely distant places however it seems pretty certain that the plant was a sacred one to the druids in the time of the romans ovid speaks of this in the line ad viscum druidae contraire solvent at their solemn meetings which were held in remote sacred groves a druid clad in white robes cut the mistletoe with a golden sickle then apparently human sacrifices were offered and a general festival took place some remnant of this custom seems to have persisted down in herefordshire until recent times for the tune hey dairy down 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 dairy which means in a circle move we round the oak is supposed to be a relic of the hymn chanted by the druids when they had found mistletoe on the oak it was said in the middle ages to be a useful cure for epilepsy madness and giddiness that is not at present the general view indeed under present conditions it might conceivably promote the last and even the second of these disorders though in an agreeable way the mistletoe and its allies loranthus and arceobium grows upon the branches of trees like the orchids and gooseberries already mentioned but they differ altogether in having a special kind of absorbing root which sinks down into the bark until it reaches the wood of the host tree the sap running up the tree is then tapped by this root and goes to supply the mistletoe with water and salts and solution it has however its own green leaves thrushes eat the berries of the mistletoe they will be left upon a branch with the guano 
as the latter dries up the seed is drawn to the underside of the branch and sticks in a crack or crevice it then sends its sinker root mentioned above into the branch every year afterwards new mistletoe roots are formed which grow through the soft part of the bark and sends down sinkers into the wood cases of mistletoe forty years old have been recorded the trees which they prefer are the apple and after that black poplar though mistletoe may be found on silver fir various pines and others it is more difficult to get it grow on the oak than any other tree indeed only seven cases of mistletoe growing on oak have been recorded in this country it is quite a valuable crop in some places and is sent in tons to the london market there are many species of mistletoe and at least one kind attacks and is parasitic upon another species of mistletoe most mistletoes and loranthus have their own green leaves and only take from the plant to which they are attached sap and mineral salts but in chile there is a beautiful loranthus that has practically no green leaves at all its blood-red flowers grow up dense masses upon the giant cactus which is common on the drier hills and these are always mistaken for the cactus's own flowers which are quite different these almost leafless loranthus and curious arthurbium are more parasitic than ordinary mistletoes for they obviously take other food material probably sugar and albuminoids from their host another series of parasites or cannibals are quite common in great britain one often sees in some meadow that the grasses are grown in a scanty and unhealthy manner then one notices amongst them number of the yellow rattle or the eyebright which germans call milk thief these plants are not very remarkable in any way but if one examines them closely one sees that the leaves and stems are more purplish red than is at all usual with our ordinary flowering plants but if you dig up some of the specimens very carefully then the wickedness of the yellow rattle and eye bright becomes apparent every here and there upon their roots are little whitish swellings which are firmly attached to the roots of other plants generally of grasses these two robber plants send from these wellings minute sucker roots which pierce into the grass root and intercept the water which the grass have been absorbing for itself they are therefore parasites and indeed they may cause a considerable loss of forage in the meadow a good many other british plants are root thieves besides these two there are the cow wheat red rattles toad flax broom rapes and toothwort a curious point about them is that they differ amongst themselves in the degree in which they are dependent on the works of others some are able to grow quite well without any such extraneous help but the broom rape and the toothwort are extremely dependent on others labors they have extremely little chlorophyll and very small leaves and are clearly parasites pure and simple there are about a hundred and eighty species of broom rape or banch all of them attack roots and most confine their attentions to one particular flowering plant their colors are generally very striking and unusual our british species are reddish flesh-colored or dirty white but some of the foreign kinds are blue or violet yellow or yellowish to dark brown generally the seedling broom rape worms its way down into the earth till it root tips touches the roots of its special favorite host then the root of the broom rape fixes itself for life its suckers grow into the host and absorb all the food material which it requires those kinds which attack tobacco and hemp are dangerous pests and do considerable damage the toothwort lathoria is so called because its scales have a sort of resemblance to human teeth with the curious superstition which prevailed in medieval times it was supposed that the plant must be a remedy for toothache because it resembled teeth unfortunately this is not the case it is generally quite like the broom rape in its methods of growth but it sends out long thread-like branching roots with suckers on the ends which become fastened on the hazel roots for several years the plant remains underground and forms very odd-looking white scaly branches these scales are formed back in such a way to form peculiar and irregular cavities which open to the outside near the tip of the leaf there is no doubt that the animacula of sorts gets into these cavities and probably die there in that case their remains will form a useful supplement to the diet of the plant the following remarks however taken from kerner have been disputed by other botanists certain of the cells lining these cavities appear to send out delicate filaments when small animals penetrate into the labyrinthine chambers of a 
leaf and touch the organs just described the protoplasmic filaments are protruded and lay themselves upon the intruders they act as prehensile arms in holding the smaller prey chiefly in furosora and impede the motion of larger animals so as to cut off their retreat no special secretion has been observed to be excluded in the follicular chambers of the lanthria but seeing that some time after the creatures have entered the chambers the only remains of them that one meets with are claws legs bristles and little amorphous lumps their sarcoed flesh and blood having vanished and left no trace we must suppose that the absorption of nutriment from the dead prey here ensues but strange as these broom rapes and tooth warts may be they are quite inconspicuous as compared with the gigantic parasites in sumatra and java in eighteen eighteen when sir stamford raffles was making a tour in the interior of sumatra his party came across one of those extraordinary plants which have been called after him imagine a gigantic flower in the shape resembling a very fleshy forget-me-not but more than a yard across the color is a livid fleshy tint and the smell is like that of a charnel house this extraordinary reflexia or noldi is the biggest flower in the world it has no proper stems or leaves but consists merely of this huge flower bud attached to the roots of the figs etc which traverse on the ground in these forests it is said to be only found in places frequented by elephants which are supposed to carry its seeds on their feet there are four other kinds known all of them occur in sumatra java and other neighboring islands r padma for example has a flower about eighteen inches across its central part is a dirty blood red while the lobes have almost the color of human skin this also has a cadaverous smell anything but pleasant these weird reflections seated on the roots which wind about on the dark forest ground have impressed every observer yet if one glances back it is interesting to see how insensible are their transitional steps which lead from independent life by the plant's own exertions to these last pure parasites which are entirely dependent on other plants for everything that they require the only other flowering plant which we shall mention in this chapter is now fortunately very rare in great britain this is the daughter coscuda it belongs to the convolvulus or bindweed order but it is entirely different from the rest of the family some climbing plants do throttle or choke the trunks of young trees if they twine around them too closely but the daughter has an entirely special and peculiar way of supporting itself to the detriment of others it has no roots no leaves and scarcely any green chlorophyll the daughter is just a twining thread-like yellowish stem which carries here and there small round clusters of little convolutes like flowers whenever the daughter thread twines round a hop or other plant it puts out small suckers which drive their way into the stems of the hop and take from it all the food which the daughter requires when well developed it forms dense yellowish tangles of intricately entwined threads which may cover whole bushes and entirely destroy the supporting plants the flax clover and hop daughters are perhaps the worst of them all there are some rather interesting points in the history of the tiny daughter seedlings it remains quietly waiting for about a month after most other plants have germinated then it begins to grow rapidly its tips pierces the soil and become fixed in it then the rest of the little thread-like seedlings begins to curve round or revolve if it touches a grass or even a nettle stem it twines itself or coils round it and drives in its suckers and on the strength of the nourishment which it extracts it goes on revolving or turning until it forms the dense tangles masses referred to then an eruption of flowers appears from which later on hundreds of tiny seeds are let loose which will become daughters in their turns the series of parasitic plants which have now been mentioned form a very interesting set it must be pointed out that those which live merely on dead vegetable matter are good plants they help on the quick and thorough employment of worn-out materials nor can we say offhand that other parasites are bad they do kill other plants and do them harm but then are they not like a cattle breeder who sends his inferior cattle to the butcher keeping only those which are the very best of their kind perhaps these plants by destroying the weak and unhealthy kinds are doing a great deal of good another interesting point about such parasites is that they are generally rare they must be less common than their hosts yet another is that they are all degenerates they show distinct traces of decay and bad development in their flowers and seeds 
that is also true in the case of parasitic animals whether they do good or harm to the world of plants is doubtful but there is no doubt they are doing harm to their own chances end of chapter 26 chapter 27 of the romance of plant life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by devora allen the romance of plant life by george francis scott elliot chapter 27 plants attacking animals brittle star versus algae fungus versus mealworm Stag-headed caterpillars, liverwort versus small insects, natural flower pots, water cups of bromeliads, saracenia and inquiring insects, an unfortunate centipede, pitcher plants, their crafty contrivances, blowflies defy them and spiders rob them, bladderwort's traps which catch small fry, hares and their uses, plants used as flypapers, butterwort versus midges its use as rennet, sundew and its sensitive tentacles, pinning down an insect, suffocating and chloroforming the sundew, Venus flytrap which acts like a rat trap. Have plants a nervous system? On the whole, the animal world preys upon the vegetable world, and is in a way parasitic upon it. Indeed, the connection between the two is very intimate, that of the diner and his dinner. One can scarcely imagine a more intimate connection than this. There are, however, a great many cases in which plants have turned the tables on their enemies and deliberately laid themselves out to catch and to destroy, to feed upon and to devour insects and small animals. One finds a few examples in almost every group of plants. Thus there are certain green seaweeds or algae which are said to attack and prey upon those peculiar sea urchins known as brittle stars. The fungus which forms loops, acting exactly like a poacher's rabbit snare, in order to catch mealworms, has already been mentioned. Sometimes in the summer, one may notice a little red club about two to three inches long sticking out of short grass. If one carefully picks this up, it is found to be growing out of a dead chrysalis or grub. It is a fungus whose spores have attacked the caterpillar. They have developed inside its body and eventually, having completely eaten up the insect, form the red club, which is producing hundreds of thousands of spores intended to attack other caterpillars. An allied fungus forms a peculiar branched fruit, rather like a minute stag's horn, and the caterpillar may be seen for some time crawling about with this extraordinary fungus sticking out of its head. Of course, the bacteria are, some of them, by far the most dangerous foes of animals. Then there is a small liverwort, a little red, moss-like plant, Frulania tamarisci, which may be found growing on the bark of trees, which is said to catch animalcula in the small sack-like leaves which are underneath the ordinary ones. But it is amongst the higher flowering plants that one discovers the most extraordinary and purposeful arrangements for capturing and digesting insects and other creatures. In the case of many of these insectivorous plants, traps or pitfalls are prepared for the insect to fall into. There are many plants in which the rain is intended to run in one particular direction, and it is not at all uncommon to find hollows at the base of the leaf where dust, dirt, and dead insects accumulate. One very curious plant of this sort is Dyscidia rafflesiana, in which the leaves have become quite like a pitcher, and have been compared to natural flower pots intended to hold rain and leaf mold. Then there is the bromelia or pineapple family which consists for the most part of plants which live on the branches of trees. In very many of these, a small cup is formed in the middle of the rosette or tuft of leaves, and water collects in this central cup. The water smells abominably, and contains the bodies of dead insects and rubbish of all kinds. The remnants of these drowned insects are probably of use, because any valuable nitrogenous or other material may be absorbed with the water by the plant and help to nourish it. But in such a rough contrivance as this, there is nothing comparable to the side-saddle plant, pitcher plant, and others. The former, saracenia, or side-saddle plant, is a common and rather widespread North American plant, which is especially abundant in Florida. 
It is cultivated in most botanical gardens, but can only be grown in greenhouses. The leaves are about six inches to a foot long, and are hollow, funnel-shaped tubes, with a short, flat wing along one edge. They may be an inch or two in diameter at the top or wider end, where there is also a sort of half-open lid, which keeps rain from getting into the inside of the leaf. The color of these tube-like or vase-like leaves varies. It is often variegated with brown, red, and yellow, and is conspicuous enough even at a distance. Thus insects fly to these vases and alight on the little cap or lid where they find honey and enjoy themselves. Other insects crawl up along the rim or wing of the vase, finding honey here and there along their road. Having got to the lid, the insect, being of an inquiring or inquisitive disposition, will look inside the tube and endeavor to find more honey therein. It reaches the rim of the vase and finds that there is honey inside. It can easily crawl down and fails to notice that the inside of the vase is lined with long stiff points which all point downward. These points or hairs do not at all interfere with its passage down, and it proceeds to the honey which forms a smooth slippery coating. Then after greedily absorbing the honey, it tries to get out again, but that is quite a different matter. Each one of these points or hairs is facing it, and the whole inside is smooth and slippery. It struggles, slips, and falls into a pool of water which fills the lower part of the vase. That is what the plant has developed these pitchers for. The body of the insect after a time decays away, and only its empty shell remains. An extraordinary number of insects are caught by these Saracenia vases. Sometimes in one which is only ten inches long, three or four inches will be full of the corpses of black beetles and other drowned insects, and it is said that birds occasionally visit these vases in order to pick them out. There is probably some sort of secretion in the water. A centipede, one and two-thirds inches long, having fallen into a vase of Saracenia purpurea in the night, was found only half immersed in the water. The upper half of the creature projected above the liquid, and made violent attempts to escape but the lower part had not only become motionless, but had turned white from the effect of the surrounding liquid. It appeared to be macerated, and exhibited alterations which are not produced in so short a time in centipedes immersed in ordinary rainwater. In some Saracenias, the vase is brought up into a sort of hood or dome, with the entrance at one side and below. There are thin patches on this dome or cupola, and small insects, attracted by the light which comes through these bare places, remain dashing themselves against them, or crawling over them just as flies do on a window pane, until they become tired and fall down into the water below. There is something horrible in the cold and careful way in which this plant arranges its baits for confiding insects. The latter are fed with honey, even on the very border of the assassin's den, but after this farewell revel, they generally slip upon the smooth edge, and are hurled, like lost souls, down into the abyss. In another plant, the pitcher plant, Nepenthes, so called from the drug which produces the sleep of death, we find an even more beautifully arranged pitcher, which acts in very much the same way. It is, however, only the end of a rather long leaf, or rather of its midrib, that is turned up to act as a pitcher. There are similar stiff hairs pointing downwards, and honey is plentifully secreted. But in Nepenthes there is also a distinct secretion which digests the bodies of the drowning insects. The ferment resembles the active principle of the gastric and pancreatic juices of the human body, and, as acids are also present, the insect's body becomes changed into nutritious juices which readily diffuse into the plant. Dr. McFarlane found that when the pitchers were stimulated by being given insects, the liquid inside them could digest fibrin to jelly in from three quarters to one hour's time. But certain insects have somehow managed to educate their larvae to resist the gastric juices of Nepenthes. Near Fort Dauphin, in Madagascar, I found great quantities of Nepenthes madagascariensis. Almost every pitcher was one-third to two-thirds full of corpses, but in some of them large, fat, white maggots, of a very unprepossessing appearance, were quite alive and apparently thriving. These must have been the larvae of a blowfly similar to that which has been mentioned by others as inhabiting Saracenia. At the same place a white spider was very often to be seen. Its web was spun across the mouth of a pitcher and its body was quite invisible against the bleached remains inside. It had suited its color to the corpses within, 
in order that it might steal from the Nepenthes the due reward of all its ingenious contrivances. A totally different arrangement is found in an inconspicuous and ugly little marsh and ditch plant called Utricularia, or bladderwort. It is very difficult to see, for unless it happens to be in flower it is entirely submerged in the water. The flowers, which are purple, are conspicuous and easily seen even at a distance. On these submerged leaves there are hundreds of small bladders. They are about the size of a pea, and are most ingeniously contrived to catch small water animalcula. The general idea of the bladderwort is exactly that of the eel pots, so common in some parts of the Thames. There is a small flap which acts as a trap door. Small creatures probably take refuge in the bladders when pursued by the larger water fleas, etc., for it must seem to them to be a safe and secure retreat. But once within the door, they are imprisoned and cannot find their way out again. They perish inside, and their bodies are digested by the plant. On the inside of the bladder, there are gland hairs which also secrete a digestive fluid. The bladderwort is dangerous to fish, for the little fry, when quite small, run their heads and gills into the bladders and are suffocated. There are a great many kinds of utricularia, and they occur in most of the great floral regions. One of them has chosen a very extraordinary and curious situation. It lives inside the little cups of water which, as we have already mentioned, are formed by the leaves of some bromeliads. The insects in the water which ought to nourish the bromeliad, Tillandsia, are really used by the utricularia. Other utricularias live in damp earth, moss, etc. It is not only by traps and pitfalls that plants catch insects. Many have specially modified hairs which are quite efficient insect catchers. Hairs are used by plants for many different purposes, and it is rather interesting to see how quite a simple organ like a hair can be altered. The stinging hair of the nettle has already been mentioned. Many grasses possess minute, rough, flinty hairs, which probably prevent snails from eating them. That also is probably the reason of the strong, rough, coarse hairs which cover the borage and the comfrey. Then, on the chickweed and the bird's-eye speedwell, there are lines of rather long, flexible hairs, which at first sight appear to be of no use at all. But if you take either of these plants, and holding it upright, place a large drop of water on the leaves, you will see that these hairs are intended to carry the water down the stem. The water runs along them. It is a very pretty little experiment, especially if done in artificial light, so that these hairs are, like the root hairs, intended to absorb or suck up water as it passes over them. Then the Edelweiss and the Lammy's Lug, Stachys lanata, are entirely covered with white cotton woolly hairs. These are intended to keep the water in the plant, and do so as effectively as a rough woolen coat will keep out rain and mist. Silky hairs, downy hairs, and others are found wrapping up the tiny baby leaves in the bud. They probably keep them warm, and perplex and ward off objectionable insects. But perhaps the sticky or glutinous hairs are the most wonderful of all. They are found on many plants, such as salvia glutinosa, plumbago, and catchfly. One can see insects stuck on them and vainly struggling to be free, and the hairs undoubtedly prevent green fly and other such pests from interfering with the honey of the flower. In some of these cases it has been shown that the body of the insect is actually used as food, but that is more obvious with two interesting plants which specially devote themselves to the capture of insect prey. One of these is very often kept in the Boer farmhouses near Tulba in South Africa, simply to attract the flies, which are a perfect pest in those dry valleys. Another drosophyllum, the flycatcher, grows on sandy and rocky ground in Portugal and Morocco. This is also used by the peasants near Oporto as a convenient flypaper. In both of these plants, large drops of a sticky, glistening liquid are secreted by the hairs which cover the leaves. Any small insect alighting on the latter is sure to get covered by the liquid, and in trying to get away will become hopelessly involved in it. It is probably soon suffocated, for the gummy matter will choke the small air holes by which it breathes. Both these plants are said to secrete both an acid and a digestive secretion. But we have two plants which are even more interesting in this country. Walking over the rough marshy pastures or moors of Scotland, one is sure to notice, generally on wet, peaty, and barren soil, a little rosette of bright yellow-green glistening leaves. If it is the right season, there will be a handsome purple flower whose stalk springs from them. 
This is the butterwort, Pinguicula, and it is not a bad name, for the leaves remind one of butter. The whole upper surface of the leaves is covered with tiny glands secreting a sticky, glistening matter. It is said that there will be as many as 50,000 of these glands on a square inch of the upper surface. Now, in such places, everyone knows that there are quantities of midges, and also that these insects are always exceedingly thirsty. They prefer blood, it is true, but when they see these bright yellowish leaves, they naturally go to them. When, however, the midge touches the leaf, the sticky liquid clings to its wings and legs, and it cannot escape. So far, this does not differ from the flycatchers mentioned above. But another very curious action then begins. If the midge or fly is near the margin of the leaf, the edge of the latter begins to curl or roll inwards over it. It does so very slowly, and may not finish rolling over the insect for some hours. Whilst this is going on, acids and gastric juice, or ferments which act in the same way, are being poured over the body of the midge, which is finally completely digested. Next day, having finished the midge, the leaf majestically unrolls itself again and waits for another. The juice contains rennet, and is used by the laps in making a horrible delicacy called tatmilk. It has also been used by the Swiss shepherds for at least two hundred years to cure sores on cow's udders. The other British plant is the sundew, drosera. Everyone who has been on peat mosses and moors probably knows its little reddish rosettes of small rounded or spoon-shaped leaves lying on bare peat or wet mossy ground. Each leaf seems to be covered by hundreds of glittering little dewdrops, whence the name. The hairs or tentacles which cover the leaf secrete this glistening, sticky fluid. There must be about two hundred of them on a single leaf. An insect flying about near the sundew is sure to be attracted by the conspicuous glittering reddish leaves, and probably alights upon it. Then it finds itself caught and begins to struggle, but this simply brings it against more tentacles. Now happens the most wonderful part of the whole performance. All the neighboring tentacles, although they have not been touched, bend over towards the struggling insect and pin it down in the middle of the leaf. They do not bend over very quickly. In two or three minutes they will bend over towards it through an angle of 45 degrees, and it takes them ten minutes to bend over 90 degrees. There is something rather horrible in the sight of a large insect struggling with these slow, remorseless, well-aimed tentacles. Most people free the insect, unless, at least, it happens to be a midge. The point which is so difficult to understand is to know how those untouched tentacles know that the insect is there, and exactly where it is. There is no doubt that they do know, for they behave exactly as if they were the arms of a spider. If you put two insects on either side of the middle of the leaf, half the tentacles will pin down one, and the other half will deal with the other insect. At the same time, acids and ferments are poured out which digest the insect. It takes about two days for a leaf to finish off an insect, and then the tentacles again unclose. Moreover, it is difficult to deceive those tentacles. They will bend in for the tiniest piece of useful substance. For instance, a length of one seventy-fifth of an inch of woman's hair will make them secrete digestive fluid. One millionth part of a pound of ammonium phosphate will also produce secretion. But a shower of heavy rain, grains of sand, or other useless material will not cause any secretion. And even if they do bend in a little, they soon discover their mistake and stand out again. If you try the same experiment under a bell glass from which the oxygen has been withdrawn by an air pump, nothing happens. Or if you chloroform the sundew, it will pay no attention to small pieces of meat until it recovers from the effects of the chloroform. When these droseras are taken to a greenhouse and experiments are made on them, they run into very great danger. They are almost certain to die of overfeeding or indigestion. It is impossible to keep people from giving them too much to eat. This wonderful little plant shows quite distinctly that there must be some way of sending messages in its leaves. Somehow the message travels from the tentacle which the fly has touched, down the stalk, into the leaf, and up into the other tentacles, and tells them that there is something worth stooping for. No one has explained this, and probably no one will ever do so. The last, and in some ways the most interesting of all these carnivorous plants, is Venus's flytrap, Dionea mosipula which grows in North America from Rhode Island to Florida. It is a quite small herb, with a small circle of leaves which lie flat on the ground. Each leaf ends in a nearly circular piece, which is divided by a very marked midrib. 
the two semicircular halves have a series of teeth along their edges. These margin teeth are stiff and a little bent upwards. In the center of each half there are three small hairs. On looking closely at these hairs, one finds that each has a joint near the base. All over the center of these leaf halves there are scattered glands which secrete ferments intended to digest any animal matter. The really interesting point is connected with these central jointed or trigger hairs. They are extremely sensitive. But when they are touched, it is not they themselves that are affected, but the entire circular end of the leaf. Suppose an insect wanders onto the leaf and reaches one of those semicircular halves. Nothing happens until it touches one of these hairs. But then both halves suddenly close together, exactly like an ordinary rat trap. The teeth on the edges of the halves interlock like the teeth of a trap, and the insect is caught and imprisoned. Its body is slowly digested away and goes to nourish the plant. The use of the joint in the sensitive hairs can be easily perceived, for when the two halves shut up together, the hairs fold down exactly like the funnel of a river steamboat when it passes under a bridge. The closing of the two halves, which has been well compared to shutting up a half-open book, is very quick as it does not take more than ten to thirty seconds. There is an abundant flow of gastric juice, but the leaf takes a long time to digest its food. It may require three weeks to finish one insect. Moreover, if overfed, it may turn a bilious or dyspeptic yellow color, and wither or even die. It only shuts for a short time if a grain of sand touches the sensitive hair, and like Drosera is not deceived in its food. The Dionea, Drosera, the sensitive plant, Mimulus, Barberry, and others, all show us clearly that plants somehow or other act as if they were conscious of what they ought to do. In fact, in all these cases, it is scarcely possible to help believing in some sort of rudimentary nervous system. At any rate, Wordsworth comes near this belief, for he has written, It is my faith that every flower that blows enjoys the air it breathes. End of chapter 27《ハプトゥ28》of the Romance of Plant Life。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen。The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Eliot。ハプトゥ28》Mosses and Moors。Peat Mosses and Their Birds。Moorlands。Cotton Grass。Scotch Whiskey。Growth of peat moss, a vegetable pump, low lying and moorland mosses, eruptions and floods of peat, colonizing by heather and scotch fir, peat mosses as museums, remains of children and troopers, Irish elk, story of the plants in Denmark, rhododendrons and peat, uses of peat, reclaiming the mosses near Glasgow. In Great Britain in this present year, One finds exceedingly few places where the influence of man cannot be traced. Over most of the country, indeed, it is impossible to discover a single acre of land where nature has been allowed to go on working at her own sweet will without interference or restraint. But near Stirling, between the lake of Monteith and the sea, there is a wide, desolate valley which is probably in exactly the same condition as it was when the Roman legions halted to reconnoitre before Agricola passed onwards to Perth and Aberdeen. Indeed, this great peat moss has been probably in very much the same condition for some two hundred thousand years, which is a nice round number to represent the ages that have passed since the Great Ice Age. Now, as then, it is inexpressibly dreary and desolate, everywhere saturated with water, and only to be traversed in dry seasons and with much agility. Even with the greatest care, the pedestrian may sink to the waist in a hole of black, slimy, peaty water. Moss, heather clumps, sedges, rushes, and occasionally cotton grass, almost at one dead level, stretch right across from the one side of the huge valley to the other. Even grouse are not common. In summer, great numbers of gulls lay their eggs upon the moss. This also is one of the few places in Britain where great flocks of wild geese can be heard and seen, but only at a distance. It is almost impossible to get near them. For the upright neck of the sentinel cannot be seen by the stalker as he wriggles towards the flock on his face, until long after the stalker himself has been plainly visible to the bird. Of all useless stretches of barren waste, 
such a moss as this seems one of the worst. It would, of course, be possible to reclaim it. Probably fertile fields and rich meadows could be formed over the whole valley. But it would not pay nowadays. There is so much good land available in Canada, the United States, and Australia, will probably remain as useless as it was in Agricola's days. In the Scottish lowlands and highlands, the moorlands are almost as desolate. At a height of 1,500 to 1,600 feet in southern Scotland, there is nothing to be seen but the undulating lines of hills, all dark purple with heather or with the peculiar scorched reddish green of deer's hair and dried sedges. Perhaps on the nearer hills, small streams may have cut a whole series of intersecting ravines in the black peat. They may be six to ten feet deep, and here and there the bleached white stones which underlie them are exposed. Now and then the cook 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 of an irate cock-grouse, and much too frequently the melancholy squawking of the curlew, irritates the pedestrian as he stumbles over clumps of heather, plunges in and out of the mossy holes, or circumvents impossible peat hags. It is indeed a remarkable fact that though these islands support forty-four millions of inhabitants, including at least one million paupers and unemployed, one-seventh of Ireland and many square miles in Scotland are still useless peat bogs. The bog of Allen alone covers 238,500 acres, and the peat is 25 feet deep. In some few places the peat is still used for fuel, and there is a theory to the effect that peat reek is necessary for the best kinds of Scotch whiskey. But neither grouse nor black-faced sheep, which live on the young shoots of the heather, employ in at all a satisfactory way these great stretches of land. Many attempts have been made to spin the silky threads of the cotton grass which grows abundantly on the Scotch lowlands. It is neither a grass, nor does it supply cotton, but is called aerioforum. It is perhaps the one really beautiful plant to be found on them, for its waving heads of fine silky white hairs are exceedingly pretty. The heather itself gives a splendid red and purple shade, which in summer and autumn is always changing color, but it is monotonous. Neither the little bog asphodel with its yellowish flowers, nor red drosera, or butter-colored butterwort, are particularly beautiful. After seeing such a country, one understands something of the Cameronian covenanters, who held their conventicles and took refuge therein. The manner in which these mosses and moors have developed is most interesting, and yet difficult to explain. There are two kinds of peat mosses, which, although there are many intermediate types, may be kept apart. The first, like the one near Stirling, Locker and Solway moss, near Dumfries, and Linwood, near Glasgow, have been formed in low-lying flat estuarine marshes. If one refers back to page 210, it will be seen how reeds and rushes and marsh plants may gradually fill up river backwaters. Eventually, a saturated, marshy meadow is produced. Then comes the chance of that wonderful moss, the peat moss, or sphagnum. It is scarcely possible to appreciate its structure without the help of a microscope and a good deal of trouble in the way of imagination. It is in a small way a sort of vegetable pump, which raises water a few inches or so. Stem and leaves and branches possess little cistern cells, which act both as capillary tubes raising the water and also retain it. The stems are upright and develop many branches so that they become a close-ranked or serried carpet of upright moss stems squeezed together, which floats on the surface of the water. Each moss stem is growing upwards and dying off below. In consequence, the bottom gets filled up by dead mossy pieces, which accumulate there, while the live moss carpet remains floating on the surface of the loathly, black, peaty water. In many peat mosses, the water gets entirely filled up, but that does not stop the formation of the peat moss. It is now resting on the water-saturated remains of its forefathers, and if water is abundantly supplied, it goes on developing. Thus, in these lowland or estuarine peat mosses, the moss eventually occupies the water and goes on growing. After this, it develops like the moorland mosses, which cover most of the lowlands and highlands of Scotland. They cover the hills, and it looks exactly as if some giant had plastered all those hills with a layer of six to ten feet of black peat from 1,250 feet upward. The soil would at first be covered by a saturated moss carpet of sphagnum and other mosses. 
rainwater falling upon it was all retained, and very little could get away, for the sphagnum carpet is just like a huge sponge soaking up and retaining the water. But it sometimes happens in these great upland mosses that there are enormous falls of rain which continue for days. Then the water collects under the living moss carpet and over the dead peat. It may be gathered together in such quantities that the carpet of living peat above it bursts, and a deluge of peaty water overflows the surrounding country, destroying and spoiling everything that it encounters. The worst of these inundations of black mud that has happened in recent years was in December 1896, near Rathmore, where two hundred acres of bog burst, and a horrible river of mud overflowed the country for ten miles. Nine people perished, and enormous destruction was caused. There have been many other cases. In 1824, Crow Hill Bog near Keithley burst, and in 1745, in Lancashire, a space a mile long and half a mile broad was covered by peaty mud. There was also a case in 1697, where forty acres of bog at Charleville burst in the same way. Attempts have often been made to calculate the rate of growth of such peat mosses. A great many of them began to develop on the mud left by the ice sheet when the glaciers retreated at the end of the Ice Age. Those mosses are therefore probably 200,000 years old. Some of our Scotch mosses are 20 to 25 feet in depth, which gives a foot in 10,000 years. By calculation of the weight of the peat formed, Einer made out that a certain moss was 20,600 years old and was growing at the rate of two inches in a century. But in Denmark, 10 feet has been formed in 250 to 300 years, and in Switzerland, 3 to 4 feet of peat moss has been formed in 24 years. This shows quite distinctly that there is no regular rate of growth, and indeed it is obvious that much must depend on the climate, on the rainfall, on the drainage, and other circumstances. Sooner or later, however, a limit comes to the growth of the moss. The surface then becomes gently curved. It is highest in the center and slopes very gently down in every direction to the edges. What happens next? The first sign is that the surface begins to dry up, and heather, with grey cladonia lichens, begins to grow on the projecting tufts and tussocks. Occasionally, if gulls build their nests on such drying up mosses, patches of bright green grass appear wherever the gulls are in the habit of resting. That is due to the lime in their guano. But under quite natural conditions, a much more important and interesting change begins. Here and there, scattered over the moss, miserable little seedling birches and scotch firs begin to struggle for life. Of course, if there are hares and rabbits, or if sheep and cattle are allowed to graze upon the moss, those firs have no chance whatever. They are eaten down to the ground. But if allowed to go on growing, they would no doubt cover the whole moss with a wood of birch and scotch fir. In time, that wood would by its roots and its formation of fine leaf mold so radically alter the ground that a forest of oaks might be possible. It is, in fact, quite likely that most of our highland and scotch hills were at one time covered by fine forests of scotch fir, of which the Silva caledonica spoken of by Tacitus was an example. There is, moreover, evidence to show that this was the case. There is one strange peculiarity of peat, which renders it a most useful substance to antiquarians. Anything lost in a peat moss does not decay away, but remains in a blackened but still recognizable condition for hundreds of years. Not long ago, a basket containing the bones of a child was found in a Scotch peat moss. There is also a story that an English trooper of the 14th or 15th century and his horse were discovered in Locker Moss near Dumfries. The man's features were traceable at first, but fell into powder when exposed to the air. But the weapons, stirrups, etc., were all perfectly preserved. Bones of the extinct Irish elk have often been found. Not merely so, but the piles of lake dwellings and the rough dug-out canoes which were used by the early inhabitants of Britain have been discovered in a great many places. Coins of Roman, medieval, and modern times have been unearthed, and indeed there is no doubt that if Britain is still inhabited two thousand years hence, boots, sardine tins, brass cartridges, clay pipes, and other characteristic products of our own days will be disentombed from the peat by enthusiastic antiquarians and displayed in museums to admiring crowds of our descendants. The reason is quite simple. 
In peat, neither those bacteria which cause ordinary decomposition, nor worms of any kind, are able to exist, so that the material does not decay, but accumulates, though it may be blackened by peat, water, and humic acid. It is for this reason that a peat moss is such a bad, or rather an impossible, soil. Neither roots nor bacteria can thrive in saturated peat. Therefore, the flora of a peat moss is generally confined to the upper surface, where air and bacteria can reach the roots. Peat mosses are also the home of insectivorous plants, which get their nitrogenous food from the insects which they catch. In consequence of this preserving effect of peat, it is possible to trace the entire history of a peat moss from the very beginning. Remains of the dwarf willow or polar birch have been found in England, showing that those now arctic plants were then flourishing in Norfolk. These are generally in the lowest layers of peat mosses. Next follow remains of the birch and aspen, which would be growing, as they do in places today, on mossy soil where the peat was still thin. Higher up in the peat, one finds remains of scotch fir, showing that at that time regular forests of scotch fir existed, for example in Sutherlandshire and on Locker Moss, where they do not grow at present. Some hold that the goats, black cattle, and ponies which have been kept since the Roman occupation at any rate, are responsible for the destruction of these forests. Others hold that they were killed by a change of climate, but they certainly existed. Trunks of Scotch fir have even been found in peat at 2,400 feet in Yorkshire, and at heights in Scotland which are above all the present plantations. About this time it seems that the newer Stone Age men must have been in Switzerland and Denmark, for their remains and characteristic weapons occur in those countries at the same level in the mosses as the Scotch fir. Still higher in the peat comes the bog oak. With it are in Denmark remains of the bronze, iron, and Roman times. In Denmark the uppermost layers of the peat contain remains of beech trees. As this last tree only entered the country in the historic period, it is not found except in the highest layers of all. Unfortunately, we have not yet obtained in our own country the same evidence from the peat bogs as to the history of the flora of Britain. It is at least probable that it was on very much the same lines. Would it be possible to again cover our peat mosses and moorlands with forests of conifers, pines, larches, and spruces? There can scarcely be any doubt about it. It would be possible, and according to the best authorities, it would even pay to change all land which is not yielding more than seven shillings sixpence an acre into forests of pines. One of the curious facts about peat is that though a peat moss is one of the worst natural soils, yet broken up and dried peat is excellent for rhododendrons, for orchids and stoves and greenhouses, and a great many other plants. Peat consists of very much the same substances as those that go to form leaf mold. But the presence of humic and other acids and the saturation with water and consequently the absence of worms, bacteria, and also of air, make it impossible for plants to grow in a peat moss. Peat moss due specially to the cotton grass rather than the sphagnum moss is imported in great quantity from Holland, for use as litter for horses. We have in this country plenty of peat quite good for this purpose, but labor is too expensive for our homegrown peat to compete with the produce of Dutch moors but that is by no means all the uses to which peat can be put. It is interesting to mention a few of them. 1. Peat is used as fuel. 2. Growing orchids, etc. 3. Litter for poultry, cattle, and horses. 4. Food for cattle, etc. is made by rubbing the peat into small pieces and saturating with molasses. 5. Paper and a kind of felt can be made of peat. 6. Rugs and carpets can be made of peat fiber. 7. String and twine. 8. Rough sacks and mats can be made of peat fiber. Unfortunately, though all these things can be produced out of peat fiber, it has never paid to manufacture them, and there are very few of the British peat mosses nowadays where peat is even cut for fuel. It seems much more likely that the end of these peat mosses will be to become either agricultural land or forest. Near Glasgow, a large area of a useless peat moss has been reclaimed and made to yield excellent crops by using the refuse of the city. The disposal of such refuse used to be a most troublesome and expensive process, but now it is turned to good effect. It was suggested a few years ago that peat, which is not worth conveyance, should be burnt on the spot and the energy transmitted by wires. 
that would be quite impossible, in at least four years out of five, over most of Scotland. End of chapter 28《Chapter Twenty Nine of the Romance of Plant Life》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon.《The Romance of Plant Life》by George Francis Scott Elliot. Chapter Twenty Nine: Names and Superstitions. Giving names the first amusement. Curious and Odd Names, A Spiteful Naturalist, The Melancholy Bartsia, Common Names, British Orchids, Dancing Girls and Columbines, Susans, Biblical Names, Almond, Apple, Locust, Spikenard, Tares, Effects of Darnell, Daffodil, Acanthus Leaf, Ghost Disturbing Branches, Elder or Boar Tree, its powers and medicinal advantage, Danewort, Mandrake, how to pull it up, the insane root, its properties, plants which make bones pink, the betel nut, henna, Egyptian and Persian uses, castor oil, leeks, onions, and garlic, ancient use of them. Man has always taken a certain pleasure in giving names to both plants and animals. It was, of course, a necessity to do this, but it is probable that people enjoyed the process, as they do now. At the present moment there must be at least 200,000 plants named and described by botanists, so that the number of ecstatic moments enjoyed by humanity has been undoubtedly increased. The Egyptians, the Babylonians, and the Arabs named a great many plants, but for the most part those names are quite lost. Most of the knowledge of the Egyptians and Babylonians remained a close secret confined to their priestly colleges or universities, and has entirely perished. For centuries, those fragments of the knowledge of Greece and Egypt which were preserved seem to have been translated and taught in Latin. Long after the Roman Empire had passed away, all knowledge, including that of medicine, of botany, and of law, was imparted in Latin which indeed was supposed to be learnt by every educated person almost until the present century. Even now, descriptions of new plants have to be given in Latin, and the name must have a classical appearance. Of course, nowadays it would be much more convenient and much more generally useful if every person learnt English, German, French, and Japanese, but in this case of naming plants, the Holy Roman Empire still exercises its sway over the whole world. Very often, the names given to plants are of the most extraordinary character. The Latin is curious, and the Greek remarkable, yet sometimes they are both pleasant to the ear and have a pretty and poetical meaning. Pagiophyton, on the other hand, for example, means the plant discovered by Dr. Pagi, a German botanical explorer. Vermskjoldia, Zaubruchnira, Krashininakauia, Acanthsichios, Chikrasia, Oricophragmus, Warzewischia, Lichnophoriopsis, Krumholtzia, Pseudorachalicus, Chekliwia, Shakia are all names that sound harsh and look odd to us, yet most of them are just called after those who discovered them or their friends. In many of the smaller microscopic plants, the names are really much longer than the plants themselves. Thus, Pseudoceratolus kinkeri is a diatom which cannot possibly be seen without the use of a microscope. Names are and were given in the most extraordinary way. Not merely great botanists, but Themistocles, Aristides, Aristobulus, Virgil, and even Gaius and Cleanthes have plants named after them. Yet that is not inexcusable, if people had not sufficient inventive power to do better. There was a naturalist who quarreled with the great French scientist Buffon. Therefore, he baptized as Buffonia a group of ugly, unimportant little plants which had an unpleasant smell. In other cases, people have named plants after their sweethearts or friends. A British plant called Bartzia has a rather melancholy, desolate appearance. It was named when the author had just received the news of the death of his friend, Dr. Barsh. One of the most usual complaints which one hears from those who are beginning to study flowers is that the Latin names are so difficult and hard to remember. But they are not really more difficult than the common popular names, and especially those of foreign plants. 
Hirostomon, for instance, which means stamens like a hand, is much easier to speak and to remember than Macpau Sochitil Quiowigil, which is its soft, meandering Spanish-American name. Asperula, little rough one, is quite as good as Squinancywort, which means an herb good for quinsy. It is, moreover, of no good in quinsy. Perhaps, however, wood rough, which is really wood row, from the resemblance of the leaves to an old-fashioned spur, or Waldmeister, master of the woods, are as good names as Asperula. Then Erigeron, which means soon growing old, is an excellent description of the faded appearance of this little weed, for which the popular name is fleabane. It has no effect upon these creatures whatsoever. How popular names came to be associated with particular flowers is generally quite unknown. A fair number are called from the diseases which they are supposed to cure. Lungwort, however, was so called because the lichen pulmonaria had a resemblance to lungs. Then, in course of time, people began to suppose it was a cure for diseases of the lungs, which it is not. The British orchids are called bee, spider, fly, and hanging man orchids because of a fancied resemblance to their namesakes. Dancing girls, mantisia, was so called from a certain resemblance of the flower to a columbine. The true columbine, aquilegia, was so called because of a resemblance which someone saw to a circle of little doves with wings seated on a circular well. The greatest objection to popular names, however, lies in their being so indefinite. Entirely different plants are known by the same name, and also in different parts of the country, totally different names are given to the same plant. All such difficulties disappear if one takes the trouble to learn the Latin names. These also are often quite pretty. Luzula, Veronica, with its pretty legend, Mimulus, the little monkey, Circaea, Enchanter's nightshade, Senizio, the old man from its woolly head of fruits, Nymphia, Nias, Carlina, the old witch, and so on, are quite as pretty and as nice as mugwort, devil in a bush, hairy rockcress, and the rest. One curious result of the use of popular names is seen in the biblical names of plants. The rose of Sharon seems most probably to have been Narcissus Tarzetta and not a rose at all. As regards the lilies of the field, Mr. Ridley has the following remarks. The Hebrew word Shushan was a generic name given to a mixture of flowers, exactly as we now talk of ferns, herbs, or grass. The Sermon on the Mount was preached near the plain of Genesaret, and there flourished the anemone, anemone coronaria, ranunculus asiaticus, and adonis estivalis, and flamia, which are exactly of the same color and follow each other in close succession. This word, shushan, is the original of the Christian name Susanna or Susan. The Arabic name for anemone coronaria is Susan. The almond of the Bible is the common almond, which is wild in Syria and Palestine. Aaron's rod that budded was a branch of an almond tree. The bowls of the golden candlestick were designed from the almond blossom. Even at the present time, English workmen call the glass drops for ornamenting candlesticks almonds. The apple of the Bible was more probably an apricot. The husks of the prodigal son were probably the locust beans, sometimes called St. John's bread, but it is quite probable that the locusts eaten by St. John were the insects. At any rate, locusts are regularly eaten in the East. The locust tree, Ceratonia siliqua, or algaroba, or carob, has large, dark purple pods. There is a pulpy material between the seeds which forms a valuable cattle food. The seeds are said to have been the original carat weight of jewelers. The spikenard, Nardostachus jadamansi, belongs to the natural order Valerianaceae. It is a wild plant of Bhutan found near Rangasnati in India, and in ancient times it was transported on camels by the regular caravan route to Syria, Greece, and Rome. It was then worth about three pounds ten shillings per pound. The essence is obtained from the roots, but one hundred pounds of roots will furnish only half a pound of essence. Now it has but little value. The tares sown amongst the wheat were probably the seed of the darnel. When growing, this grass is very like wheat, and it would be quite possible to mistake one for the other until the flowers and fruit are formed. Darnell is one of the very few poisonous grasses. It is said that the poison is produced by a fungus which is found in the grain. When darnell seed is ground up with wheat, the bread becomes dangerous. 
for the poison produces severe headache, vertigo, and giddiness. Other authorities say that it causes in man and rabbits eruptions, fits of trembling, and confusion of sight. It seems not to affect horned cattle, swine, and ducks. As regards those plants which were specially loved and venerated by the Greeks, there is not very much to say. Moly seems to have been allium moly, one of the onion or garlic family. It is not very remarkable in any way. Amaranth was apparently the garden love lies bleeding, called in France Cue de Renard and Discipline des Religieuses. The asphodel, which covered the Elysian fields, seems to be Asphodelus ramosus. This grows in quantities in Apulia and is said to afford good nourishment for sheep. The myrtle, with which the Athenian magistrates and victors in the Olympic Games were crowned, is not really a European plant, though it has a wide range from Asia Minor to Afghanistan. It was sacred to Venus and had some importance as a medicinal plant and for perfumes. It was even used in cookery and for making myrtle wine, which last is said to be still prepared in some parts of Tuscany. Narcissus, son of the river Cephesius and of Liriope, daughter of the ocean, was a young man of great beauty who scorned all the nymphs of the country, and made to die of languor echo, because he would not respond to her passion. But one day, returning from the chase, weary and fatigued, he stopped at the side of a fountain to refresh himself. There, having seen his own face in the water, he was so smitten with it, and so greatly loved himself, that he died of grief. The gods, touched by his death, changed him into a daffodil, according to the fable. Such is the account in M. l'Abbé L'Advocat's Dictionnaire Historique Portatif, Paris, 1760. Daffodil means appearing early in the year. The number of races, varieties, and forms of daffodil, jonquil, etc. has become innumerable. Yet it is doubtful if any are quite so graceful and absolutely charming as the Narcissus Poeticus, supposed to be the original of the above legend. The acanthus leaf, which was so much used in sculpture, seems to have been that of Acanthus spinosus. It can still be traced in modern carving, though of course it is very much altered and in a rather degenerate form. It is often very difficult to say why certain plants have received so much attention and veneration in ancient times. In some cases it is clearly because they are poisonous, and therefore become dreadful and awe-inspiring. Why, however, should a twig of rowan, Pyrrhus occuparia, be so often placed above the door of a highland cottage. In some way it was supposed to keep off evil spirits, but there is no special reason why it should have been chosen. The boar tree, or elder, Sambucus, has been the center of a whole series of extraordinary and remarkable superstitions. Of the Elhorn, Low Saxon, or Sambucus nigra, Arnkiel gives the following account. Our forefathers also held the Elhorn holy, Wherefore, whosoever need to hew it down must first make his request, Lady Elhorn, give me some of thy wood, and I will give thee some of mine when it grows in the forest. The witch, with bended knee, bare head, and folded arms, was ordinarily done. The flowers are an eyewash and cosmetic, or they may be taken as tea, or used as a fomentation. The berries are used for elderberry wine. A certain cure for rheumatism is to carry about a small piece of elder cut after the fashion of a rude cross. Evelyn, speaking of it, says, If the medicinal properties of the leaves, bark, berries, etc., were thoroughly known, I cannot tell what our countrymen could ail for, which he might not fetch a remedy from every hedge, either for sickness or wound. The other species, Sambucus ebulus, or Danewort, has had its name explained as follows by Sir J. E. Smith. Our ancestors evinced a just hatred of their brutal enemies the Danes in supposing the nauseous, fetid, and noxious plant before us to have sprung from their blood. Of all these, however, the mandrake, mandragora, is connected with the most extraordinary and remarkable superstitions. The plant is distinctly poisonous and has peculiar divided roots, which sometimes have a very rough resemblance to the human body. It was supposed to be alive, and to utter the most piercing shrieks when it was pulled out of the ground. In those accounts, which are based on that given by Josephus, it is the person who pulls out the root, and not the plant itself, that shrieks, subsequently rolls upon the ground, and finally dies in torments. Therefore, if you wish to pull up a mandrake, the correct course to pursue is as follows. Tie a dog to the plant by its tail, and then whip the dog. 
it will pull up the mandrake and then die in frightful agony. This is the insane root of Macbeth, but its various uses, real or pretended, are too numerous to explain in detail. Thus it was used for the following purposes. As a poison, an emetic, an narcotic like chloroform, in love filters and love charms, as well as to dispel demons who cannot bear its smell or its presence. There are many of these relics of medieval times which are difficult to explain or to find a reason for. Why, for instance, should old women always carry a sprig of southern wood to the kirk in their Bibles? The leaves are, however, said to be disagreeable to insects. The lavender stalks, usually placed in linen, both keep away insects and have a pleasant old-world scent. A great many of the properties possessed by plants are of the most extraordinary and unsuspected nature. The roots of the matter, rubia tinctorum, for instance, when they are eaten by swine or other animals, change the color of their bones, which become pink. This curious property has actually been made useful, for physiologists have employed matter in the study of the growth and development of bone. In India and other eastern countries, one is quite often shocked and surprised to find an apparently quite healthy native expectorating blood in a most lavish manner. But the native is only chewing betel nuts, which have the power of turning the saliva red. The fruit is that of the Arika Kateku, a fine palm which is cultivated for this purpose only in many parts of India and the East. The nuts are cut in pieces and rolled up with a little lime in leaves of the betel pepper. It is said to turn the teeth red and sometimes to produce intoxication. At any rate, people become slaves to this disgusting habit, and they do not seem to be at all injured by indulgence in it. Another extraordinary plant is henna, Lawsonia inermis. The Egyptian mummies are found to have the soles of the feet, as well as the palms and finger and toenails, dyed a reddish-orange color by the use of henna. But the practice is continued today in most parts of the East, and no odalisque's toilet would be considered complete without the use of henna. It is even said that men dye their beards with it. The white horse, used in processions by the Shah of Persia, has its legs, tail, and body dyed with henna. The powdered leaves are used. They are made into a paste with hot water, and then spread upon the place. It is grown in Syria, Egypt, Algeria, China, Morocco, Nubia, Guinea, and the East Indies. In China, women dye their eyebrows with an extract of the petals of Hibiscus rosa sinensis. One of the first plants to be utilized by man was the castor oil, Rachinus communis. It was used by the Indians from time immemorial. It is mentioned by Herodotus under the name Kiki. Seeds have been found in mummy cases, showing the careful preparations which were made for the dead when starting on their travels in the other world. It is one of the very commonest plants in the tropics, and in subtropical or warm temperate countries. It is rather handsome, and has large reddish-green leaves and handsome spikes of flowers. It is said to be sometimes 12 feet high, but is usually only 6 or 7 feet. The seeds are mottled or marbled, and have a distinct resemblance to a beetle when seen from above. It has been suggested that this protects them from birds, or enables the latter to recognize the seed, which is strongly medicinal. That, however, is at least doubtful, and certainly pigeons are exceedingly fond of the seeds and eat them in quantity. The oil is used for lighting, in making soap, and also in painting. Another characteristic Egyptian plant was the leek, which, with the onion and garlic, seems to have been one of the very first to have been brought into cultivation. Herodotus says that on the Great Pyramid there was an inscription saying that 1,600 talents had been paid for onions, radishes, and garlic used by the workmen during its erection. The Jewish priests were forbidden to eat garlic, which, with cucumber, formed the dishes most regretted by the Israelites during their wanderings in the wilderness. The shallot comes from Ascalon, where it will be remembered Richard I defeated Saladin the Sultan and where also Sir Sidney Smith defeated the Emperor Napoleon, and made him miss his destiny. It was not brought to this country till 1548. Probably, therefore, Tennyson's Lady of Shalott lived somewhere else. Onions and leeks are of course popular in this country, and especially in Wales, where the latter has been the badge of the Welsh since they gained a victory over the Saxons in the 6th century. They wore it as a badge on that occasion by an order of St. David. But in warmer countries, onions and garlic are much more important, where they have flavored almost every dish since the days of Nestor's banquet to Machaean in Asia, and of the Emperor Nero in Italy, until our own days. 
But the subject is so inexhaustible, depending as it does upon man's powers of invention and his tendency to weird superstitions, that we must close this chapter and also the book. And we will end by asking the reader to think sometimes of all these many and various ways in which plants help and interest man. It is not merely because our life depends upon them. Everything that we eat has been produced by plant life and plant work. Tea, coffee, cocoa, and wine are pleasant because plants have produced some essence which is found useful and agreeable by mankind. Even water would be tasteless and unwholesome were it not for the minute diatoms and other microscopic vegetables in it. But those who take an interest in flowers and leaves for themselves find that they need never spend a dull hour in the country. There is so much to see and to find out, even in the commonest weed or the tiniest floweret. But it is necessary to sympathize with them, to try to look at things from their point of view, and not merely from an artistic or collector's standpoint. The romance of plant life then becomes a fascinating and engrossing pursuit. But however long one studies it, the knowledge that the wisest naturalist can ever attain to must remain a negligible quantity compared with what he does not know. Suppose a mouse happened to stray into the office of the editor of the Times. He might boast to his fellow mice of his knowledge of the higher journalism, but his opinions would not really be of very great value on the subject. However hard we study, and however much we observe and reflect upon the working of this great world of nature, we really cannot expect to know more relatively than that little mouse. In fact, the more we think, the more humble men of heart we become, and the greater also should be our reverence for the creator of this wonderful universe. End of chapter 29 Recording by Colleen McMahon End of The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Elliott.